Good evening and welcome to the Select Board meeting of March 5th, 2018. I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. Uh, we start first and foremost with opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. Uh, is there anything on the agenda that anyone needs to or move around a little bit? I will make a couple of announcements about it, but if anybody had something in particular, uh, a couple of things I'll note. Um, under a four action and discussion items, uh, letter E, uh, the person that's coming to uh, talk to us about that is not likely to arrive until about 8.45, so we'll probably rearrange in order to make that happen if we uh, need to. Um, the other thing is that down in our consent calendar under seven, um, under section two, there's special wine and malt licenses for top TOC incorporated, top of campus. Uh, the the uh, May 5th, uh, excuse me, May 10th, excuse me, May 10th, 2018, we will probably pull from, we will pull from, from our, our uh, uh, approval process there because that needs a little more, we need a little more information on that one, so we're going to pull that one out of the list. So when we get to that point, we'll, we'll pull that out. Um, <clears throat> I don't believe there's anyone here for public comment since Mr. Zomek's here for a different reason and, at, and I don't think our press is going to <laughs> offer public comment this evening. So I think we'll head into our agenda. So the first thing on our agenda tonight uh, under action discussion items, municipal property uses and disposition process policy. So Mr. Zomek, if you wanna <coughs> come forward and, and walk us through the, the latest iteration of that a little bit and point out the things that have been tweaked since the last time we took a look. Thank you very much. Um, Dave Zomek, Assistant Town Manager. Uh, I was last before you, uh, I believe on February 12th, where the board discussed uh, a draft policy for the disposition of real property. I believe this is, I think, our third uh, uh, go round and, and with, with edits and whatnot. Um, I think on the 12th, there were some suggested minor edits uh, I have Ms. Kruger's uh, edits in front of me. She was nice enough to provide me if, with a few of those. I think the major edit was that we took out <clears throat> any reference to establishing a dis additional policy. Rather, we are going to establish criteria um, uh, under section, uh, under the section uh, policy and process for disposing on page two. Uh, instead of establish more policy, it was established criteria by which real property would be deemed surplus and available. And then under next steps, there is a typo there, I think, under next steps, but we would develop those corresponding criteria. Um, we also did some minor uh, tweaks on page three under section five, uh, five, B, uh, the assessed and or appraised value of property. Uh, we made a small, a small edit there. Um, those were the main, uh, there was one other on page three, uh, page three, section six. We added under 6G, restrictions that may be placed upon the property prior to sale, such as conservation, recreation and or historic preservation restrictions and public access and or other easements. So uh, those were the main, I would call those minor edits. Uh, as I've said before, I think this is a process that we're embarking on. I, I fully expect that there will be a lot of uh, uh, give and take and, and uh, uh, communication with the board obviously through this process. I think we will learn things as we go, and we may have to come back to this policy and say, we discovered something here, and, and we'd like to come back to you because we need a, a minor tweak here or, or, or something of that sort. So uh, I'm anxious to embark on this process. I think staff is anticipating uh, getting going on the inventory. So uh, look forward to working with you and the town manager in the months ahead as we uh, begin to do our assessment of property and, and begin to bring them to, the, uh, to you. I have a couple of things, but I want to ask if the other members want to. I had kind of a process question. Why don't you go ahead if it's about the draft? So there's just a couple of small things I want to mention. Um, on page two under policy and process for disposing of surplus real property, the bold, there's a list of five things. I would swap two and three because I think you want to establish criteria before you uh, 
by which real property would be deemed surplus and available for disposition, you would want to establish the criteria before you identify the real property that may be deemed surplus. I just think logically that makes a little more sense. That's a pretty subtle sort of thing. And the only other thing I would suggest, and you had already mentioned that this had been edited under uh, G under six on page three, um, if recreation and or historic preservation restrictions, I didn't know if we wanted to add affordable housing as another category um, under that type of restriction that might be placed on a property. Um, so I'm just offering those as suggestions that we may mm -hmm. want to mm -hmm. put in there or not put in there. I'm sorry, Mr. Slaughter. So affordable housing is listed as an item under recommendations 5e but in 6g you would like to make sure that we carry over basically what's also mentioned in 5e above in a sense yes because we yes. do parallel those in in right. both places one is about the particular restrictions or constraints on like the deed so, so might have acquired it and put a that caveat yeah. that it be only used for right housing. right and, and so we donated for that purpose so mm -hmm. Okay. While we're fixing that, we might as well either insert the word park in G or take it out of E. Yeah. Yes, I agree with the suggestion to add it to G6. What was the edit you had for E on 5? So 5E add in park, wait, it says park and recreation already. So in 6G. Oh, so add park, park there as well. in front of Just recreation. Just again, because mm -hmm. it's like we're not yes. trying to say that there's a difference. Right. right. Just different stages. Right. So they're really more parallel. So just to be clear, I will add park and recreation for a parallel structure there. And then, yes, that's a good point. We really did not touch on G, adding an affordable housing restriction under G. Um, sure. Those are good. Were there other so, ones, Mr. Slaughter? Those were just my more technical sort of edits of, of things. Well, um, this might be more, it could be either for Mr. Zomek or Mr. Bachelman, but just, um, I mean, I think this has come a long way and it is just, you know, every time you show it to us, we'll find a word, but I think it's in pretty good shape. So. The title, it's Surplus Real Property Disposition <coughs> Policy. It's dated. Will this become a document that will say, you know, adopted by the select board as of this date? And, you know, we've, we've all encountered trying to find a guideline from 20 years ago that might exist. But how, to, how do we take this and make it something this select board on this date adopted this policy so it has that kind of standing? Because it, it just doesn't yet, because it's not done. Um, and I just want to make sure that once we do this, it has that kind of life. Yeah, I mean, I think we can put this on select board letterhead and put all that kind of information approved on, you know, reviewed on these dates so people can go back and look at the, trans the conversations you've had on it. That's a good idea. I think the problem may be that we don't have a code, a codification similar right. to the bylaws for select board past policies yeah, we don't have the book. <laughs> and that is something that you know it, it, when it came to some of the liquor policies that we were looking up um, and we couldn't find them I think that that was the problem is we don't have a methodical compilation and public accessibility system equivalent to the bylaws and we could at least going forward try to remedy but yes we're not do all the back right now. yeah I think that you know, whatever the voters decide, um, there will be then, uh, after the charter is adopted or not, either a select board or a council going forward, and it would be good to have this kind of a policy in place for this sort of non-bylaw ordinance type of policy. Oh, we talked about that every time we try and do a policy so <laughs> we never have a book and we've never had one and it's never existed and the ones that Miss Pupple has very carefully unearthed for us over the years um, have very random sorts of history associated with them often no date and so um, 
yeah, I mean, whatever we decide is the new thing for that. Um, Ms. O'Keefe had pulled several together before she left us and put it as part of the, the handbook. But uh, yeah, it's becoming even more evident every time we try and do something and thinking about potential transitions. Including uh, Ms. Puppel no longer being here to exactly. go on her recollection and research skills. Yeah. Key. Yeah. It's a loose end. <coughs> capital L loose end. <laughs> Would it be simple enough to just add a link on your page to the various policies that we know about? I mean, there's four or five. We could start with this one. I'm most concerned with this one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. We'll go forward. We'll, going forward. we'll start We're with good. this one. We're good. We'll start with this one. Start this will the be the important new policy. example policy. Oh. Yes. Associated with that. So when we transform this onto select board letterhead and show the date and that we voted it, I would recommend that we not do the next steps section, even right. though it's yes. very valuable context, people right. have to go to the minutes for that one. Right, I would agree. So may I make a motion? Please. I would like to move to adopt the municipal property uses and disposition process policy dated March 5, 2018 as amended. Is there a second? Is there further discussion? Just one last thing. Please. Uh, Lisa, you're sort of at, this is your bailiwick of, is this one of the things, because I've unearthed this format before where the select board members actually sign a policy, or it, does it matter? If I have, we can or we cannot, I've seen it both ways. You make, if, you, you know, my you just to speak into your microphone. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm leaning yep. back. Yes. Yes, the, about signing after we do a policy. You know who it was later on. You make a truly excellent point, and that would be a worthwhile thing to attach to these. Um, it gets more complicated when it gets signed because, of course, it's as amended, and then you have to have a separate signature page or yada yada. Logistics that are unimportant to anyone other than the five of us at this moment and the people 10 years from now. Um, but I do think that's valuable because just saying it's the date is not as helpful as the date and the names. And if we want to start with just typing the names because that seems easier than having a signature page. And it it's gives legible. It a historic context more than it just makes the it day. much clearer rather than just as I have often until the most recent open meeting law uh, changes came out, I had nagged people to say, you need to say who's absent because people don't understand who the whole pool of people were right. that could have been <laughs> at that meeting as opposed to just the people who were so present. Do other people think it's good to have a sign? these policies going forward? I think it's a good group. idea. I think that just in the short term, we may need to just print our names so that it, they're... But to list, okay, I mean, you think so? I think it's perfectly fine. I, I, there are various alternatives, and I think we should just uh, let the town manager figure out the one that works, whether the names are typed in one signature oh, or care. whatever. I don't care about the signature. But just something. Just the and, scribing out who, who did know, this policy. When it comes out of in final form it'll have it yeah no, I, I don't care how the names are shown okay is there further discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. now are you happy Mr. Summer? thank you very much <laughs> um, no thank you happy it <laughs> means a little more exciting work to do thank you, thank you. <clears throat> moves it to the next step. so next on our agenda is the uh, annual town election March 27th 2018, the warrant, which we need to approve. I believe in our packet we had uh, a copy of that warrant. Mm -hmm. If I can. Yes, oh, yeah, there it is. And, um, and so, not being the same as a town meeting warrant, they're all named warrant. Yes. As is also true when, you know, there's a payroll warrant that also has to get approved, not by us, but. You know, there's different kinds of warrants. So mm -hmm. we have before us um, this one, and I presume uh, there's no action that we take as far as what's in it. Right. Pro forma, I believe, unless someone saw something. I just want to look for the motion. Please. No, go ahead and do the motion. No. I can make a comment after no, the motion. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm in no rush. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. So one of the things, it, it's, just, it's just the way it's laid out. It, it, I checked with... Mr. Bachelman and he checked with Ms. Burgess. So 
the beginning of the warrant always says on Tuesday something like, as you can see, the, the polling places on Tuesday, the 27th day of March 2018 from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., which is when polling hours are according to our town government act and is written right there. I have no idea why that sentence is just thrown at the bottom of page two in terms of cut and paste because it doesn't seem necessary for part three, which is the here of fail not part. We remember Ms. Burgess saying when she uh, speaks at town meeting, associated with town meeting warrants. But the polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. is not part of the charter question summary. It's just something that is hanging there that doesn't belong there. Don't worry about it. And it's not going to show up on the ballot. She okay. assured us that it will not. That it's hanging there. It's like just hanging orphan. there. So, and just so you know, the ballots uh, will have the candidates for office on the front, and then on all of the ballots, you have to turn over the ballot to vote on this on the question, and the question will be entire question will be on the second. You won't have to read the beginning of it, and on the right. bottom it says, "Please continue voting on the other side," and then it says, "End of right. voting." And so. as you had ex explained earlier, that way each precinct is treated equally in terms of the format of the ballot because some may need all that space for candidates right. and some may not, but they'll all have this in the same place. Okay. Are you ready for a motion? I am. Okay. Um, I move to approve the warrant for the 2018 annual town election of March 27th, 2018 as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion. Is there further discussion? Assuming that as presented includes the fact that that <laughs> sentence is gone. I was going to say right. that. As amended. I just worry. Thank you. How about amended? As amended. <laughs> and then everyone can wonder what the amendment the was. <laughs> yes. Amended. That sounds lovely. I presume that's acceptable to the second. Got to the motion sheet and we're like, oh, now what do we It didn't yes. give us the option. <laughs> yes. All right. Is there further discussion other than that? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 So we do have a version to sign mm -hmm. um, on that for later. All right, so next up is uh, 4C, which is committee appointment interview process policy. We had a memo from Mr. Kruger and Mr. S Ms. Kruger and Mr. Steinberg uh, to us. And so would you to go? flip a coin or? Uh, um, I'll start, Mr. Steinberg. So, um, We've both had a hand in the um, kind of the mechanics of the committee appointment process. And um, for a while now, we've adopted this practice of doing interviews for committee appointments, which has, has been pretty successful um, and positive in many ways, but it's also very time consuming, not just for the committee interviews, but the setting them up, the logistics. The, and so in order to kind of find some relief for that, um, Mr. Bockelman brought it to Mr. Steinberg and my attention, and we, we, we worked on this and we crafted this memo, which I think you saw an earlier, only very slightly different draft of. It was on your desk at the last meeting. Um, and so that's what you have, and why don't you add to that, Mr. Steinberg? Yeah. I think that uh, it is as stated that um, the interview process was started uh, really by Mr. Heckenbleckner and um, was a um, very good suggestion of his and added a lot to the process because it um, enabled um, a sense of fairness to the process that people who applied felt that um, whether they were chosen or not that they had um, been heard and a chance to participate and uh, <clears throat> we as uh, whether it be a town manager appointment or a select board appointment whoever was making the decision was having the benefit of meeting candidates whether it was one or more than one in order to um, make sure that the person um, understood and fit into uh, would fit into the committee and uh, knew that we were taking the committee, take committee appointments very seriously. Um, but um, also, it's an extraordinarily time consuming as Ms. Kruger stated. And so this was a matter of trying to streamline it, both by trying to divide committees and to 
allow some discretion um, on the parts of uh, the participants in the process from the town side as to who should be involved in the interview and how the interview should be conducted because not all committees um, are in the same stance. Some are, um, have uh, very have decision making and hearing roles that are very different from others that are just trying to move a project forward like um, the sister city relationship. So the, this is a policy that tries to encapsulate all of that and make it practical. Do you have anything you want to add at all? No, I appreciate the board uh, taking this into consideration. I think we talked about it at the retreat as well. Um, the process is actually quite interesting, but it is um, time consuming um, for the candidates sometimes to logistically try to organize them all to come in at the same time so that your time and the chair of the committee that they're serving on's time is, is efficient and so on. So um, depending on the committee, I think that um, sometimes these are, especially if there's uh, a lot of vacancies and we're pretty much just need people it's good to have one person would probably be, ad it'd be adequate to have them meet with them so they understand the, uh, the process and of what they're getting into. But, um, and then for major committees, we obviously, I think this process actually does work really well. So I appreciate you taking this into consideration. Further discussion? So having been committees are long before you guys had to deal with it. So <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. Um, I want to make sure it's clear to the community that interviews were frequently done with people by phone in the old days and references were infrequently but occasionally checked in the old days so it wasn't like we just took a bunch of pieces of paper and picked the one that fell out of the top of the stairs. Um, there was a process but it was not nearly this thorough and it was certainly not consistent. And so that's been one of the really nice things that came out of trying the new way is, is the consistency that, so that everyone felt like they were being fairly dealt with because there was also substantial differences in the past, even so, um, between town manager appointments and select board appointments. And so, for example, the town manager who appoints the planning board with then select board has to sign off on it unlike some newspaper articles have indicated recently, or perhaps blogs, um, the planning board appointment is made by the town manager, and the town manager didn't always interview all the applicants, and that made people frustrated. And the select board wasn't usually involved in those interviews when they did take place. And so there's been a variety of different approaches to it over the years, and this one has been the most transparent, I think, for people, and so I really appreciate that. I think we need a little bit more, I know there's just not enough words on this page, we have to go to the other side. We might need a little more verbiage in terms of just my understanding or the rest of our understanding as to specifically exactly how this will work under which committees. And so as we talk more about which committees this applies to, because I'm still a little unclear as to, for example, if we've made the decision that if it's a town manager appointment, the select board is never going to be present or the select board might be present, um, and if that varies depending on the type of committee. And by not having the town manager there, which I think is in many ways a very reasonable choice to make for a select board, direct select board appointment, it also means that it takes the town manager out of the mix in terms of the qu kinds of questions we're asking the town manager's hearing that those are the questions we're asking and that if people are not particularly necessarily a good fit for this committee or at this time because we have too many wonderful applicants that maybe the town manager's thinking of some openings for another committee and so I totally appreciate what we're doing but we will lose a little bit of that as well by having to do it just because you know for reals in terms of how <clears throat> people's time works so th that was a good good possible outcomes of what we were doing, but it, it makes it a little harder if we don't do it that way. So if we're just super clear on which is which, I think moving forward, then people will again still feel like we're, they're being dealt with very fairly as long as we all understand which ones are which. So I would um, make the case that rather than adding more words, that and unlike the um, Lynn 
land and building disposition policy. This is really about sort of select board and town manager practice that we adopt this um, and we try it out and learn from it and then maybe at a subsequent time in a couple months um, take a shot at revising it. If it. So rather than have a cut and dried, this committee shall be in this pile and this committee shall, that we work with this, it is a little bit amorphous deliberately and then we can reevaluate it. Because I, I would say this wouldn't be at the level of a policy but more like a, a kind of keeping track of a practice. But that's, evaluate in a bit and mm -hmm. perhaps be more inclined to something more, more formal later we didn't put the committees in buckets deliberately yet yes. so then moving forward how does how do those individual decisions get made and who makes them I think that it, in the end it's uh, the one or two people who are working on just running the committee appointment process if it is a select board appointed committee if it is a town manager appointment it is very explicit that it's the town manager's decision so to play that out a little bit so i see a caf come in a citizen activity form come in and somebody has approached me and said hey i finally turned into my citizen activity form and i say yay that's wonderful i have no idea what to tell them is going to happen next and so who do they that's fine i don't have to be that person <laughs> but what i want to know is who i send them to because that's that's what we just need to be clear about. When it was the same for everybody, we could speak to it. If it's not mm -hmm. for a while, if it's not going to be the same for everybody, it's totally cool. I just want to be able to know who to send them to. So, okay, the I'll point, go to Mr. Steinberg. Yeah. Point for, uh, and for, I, for now. And it is our intention that um, anyone who applies to a committee, they are um, supposed to now be getting acknowledgement that they have applied, but that. Um, everybody will have had some contact whether it be as you pointed out earlier by a phone call essentially a phone interview or scheduling an in-person interview with one person or a larger group and that we can't say but we can say that people will be contacted um, when um, as the committee selection process takes place for the committee for which they have entered a CAF and uh, I think that's one of the differences from long ago practice that it wasn't always consistent that people could predict that they would right. hear it all absolutely is there further discussion shall we move could yep. I, I do have another question. Yes, sir, please. Um, and so, I should, um, and I'm sure Mr. Wald would too if he was here, just because we're at different phases of this, having done mm -hmm. it over the years. Um, I really, really, really appreciated the part in here that talked about getting a phone call to let people know they have not been selected. So we are not frequently but on occasion blessed with more applicants than openings, and so we put all those people in potentially through the applicant process and then we tell them and it's not really clear who tells them what when and so I think that's incredibly helpful to make sure that that's clear that they will get a phone call to let them know and then who is going to make that phone call because we've just had some I think miscommunication in the past about what our expectations are for that just as we've had some miscommunication where we've appointed people here and they've never gotten their letters and so it's just a matter of making super clear who does that then but I think that is a very respectful thing to do to let people know rather than just say watch the next select board member and meeting and see if your name comes <laughs> up <laughs> it's not supposed to be the lottery <laughs> we're trying not to do that and we real we recognize that that happened which is why that um, was added in there is because there were two people interviewed for one position on the committee and we ended up it then got onto the agenda of our meeting before 
chance to contact yeah. the two people who had been interviewed was made, and I think that that was unfortunate. Right. Can I just say, my, the way it's been handled in practice most recently is um, at, when there's more applicants than vacancies, um, <laughs> whoever has been involved in that process, in that interview process, which under this could be as many as one person or the full complement. Um, after a decision is made among those people, it's decided, well, will you call this person and tell them yes, or will you call this person and tell them no? We recently had that happen as recently as last Friday, and before we left the room, we parceled that out. So it was a sign, but it, but it could be a different, it's not like always this person it was handled as the decision was made, but made sure that it was covered. Excellent. Mr. Bachelman, did you want to add to that? You were no, I, I, and it is a point of, I mean, I think with the board members who were part of it, it's, it's something that comes up, who's going to contact whom, and before it gets on the agenda, basically, yeah. Would we want to this motion? I believe so, yes. Okay, I move to approve the committee appointment interview process policy dated March 1, 2018, as presented. Is there a second? A second? Just giving you a chance. <laughs> <laughs> is there for the discussion? Yes, there so is. So that conversation we just had about what policies look like, this doesn't look anything yeah. like a policy. This looks like a memo. Right. Which is what it's supposed to yeah. look like. And right. it's in this sort of amorphous thing that we're not even really sure we're turning into a policy yet, because if we were, it would probably have more details so in it. So do we need a motion? So instead of this... Uh, Just delete the word prop policy. To... To uh, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is like this let's is say this is, this is our thing that we're going to try for the next period of time. So we can put a date, and on then it. we're going to reevaluate it sometime yeah. after blah blah yeah. date. Maybe after annual town meeting. And then that over. way, if we did have a policy yeah. book, which we don't, but if we did, then this wouldn't be in it yet. Right. This right. would just be a and we're on our yeah. way to a policy. And you know, if I might. The yes. motion says policy, but the document does not. Right. Exactly. Right. So if we, if we amended the motion to just. How about, here's the thought. I know it's too late, it's already been moved, but something along these lines. M adopt the committee appointment interview process dated March 1st with uh, sunset, and that's not how we call whatever we call it. We don't have to have that, because we can just do that when okay. we're ready. When we're ready, all right, rather than putting okay. a specific and date I, on. I agree. And the seconder agrees as well. To adopt the committee appointment interview process dated mm -hmm. March 1. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll tweak it as time goes by. It'll even someday be a policy. So we're, so we're even differentiating tonight between our policies and <laughs> our practices. Right. Someday it'll graduate to the book. That's right. The book. And the, and the little <laughs> book and the big book. That's right. <laughs> yep. Got it. Gripping television, I'm sure. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure Mr. Merzbach is you know, going to write a whole article on this. Um, is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. And so that's been adopted. I'm, I will be right back. Okay. We'll take a little short recess for a moment.
So next on our agenda is uh, action discussion item discussion item 4D, which is committee vacancy, and it's about scheduling a meeting with the Amherst Housing Authority to uh, jointly elect a new uh, member to the Housing Authority. Um, it's an untimely death of a member of, of the uh, Housing Authority, and so we are in the position of, of needing to elect uh, a new member to that board. Um, timing was such that it would not have fit uh, appropriately on the town election on March 27th, and therefore we're scheduling, as we did last fall, a meeting in, in concert with the uh, Housing Authority to, uh, to uh, interview uh, potential uh, candidates for that spot and to then elect them. Um, and so I have here in front of me uh, in, in our packet a notice of vacancy and process to jointly elect, which is a fairly extensive document which we've had to do a number of times in the last year. Um, but I wanted to mention a couple of things, um, and I'll just, I, I think I'll just read it. It's probably the easiest way to, to be very, very clear about this. The Amherst Housing Authority has provided notice to the select board that a vacancy exists on the elected board of commissioners. The vacancy will be filled by vote of a majority of the remaining members of the AHA and the Amherst Select Board and will serve until the next local election. Uh, currently, that would be March of 2019, but depending on how our annual election this year turns out, that may change uh, relative to changes in the charter if that were to occur. Um, one thing I will point out about the Amherst Housing Authority is it does have one position on the Housing Authority that is uh, the Board of Commissioners, I should say, that is appointed by the governor. Currently, that uh, seat is also vacant, um, but it is not part of the elected part of the board, and so we do not have authority over that unless a number of other events happen that we're going to deal with if that comes up, but not at this time. Um, so <clears throat> just to be explicit about when we're thinking of doing this, the vacancy will be filled by a joint meeting of the select board and the remaining members of the Housing uh, Authority Board of Commissioners on April 2nd, 2018. Uh, this election will take place at 6.45 p.m. Uh, during the regularly scheduled select board meeting in the town room on the second floor of Town Hall and will be broadcast live by Amherst Media on Channel 17. Uh, the reason that it's during our meetings because we typically start at 6.30. We'll probably do public comment and then we'll go immediately into that uh, joint session. Here's the critical pieces for those of you interested. Amherst residents interested in serving must submit a letter of interest to the select board office no later than 12 p.m., that's noon, on Thursday, March 29th, 2018. That's 12 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that can be done electronically. And must be present for the joint election on Monday, April 2nd, 2018. And we will start that at 6.45 p.m. So the critical dates and times for people, again, are noon on Thursday, the 29th, to get your letter of interest to the select board and to be present on the joint election night of April 2nd, uh, following the March 29th. So it's a fairly quick turnaround once the uh, letters are in place. As has been the case, it has been the case in the past, uh, we, will, we will have a joint session with the uh, Housing Authority. We'll do an interview process with each of the candidates, um, which is outlined in our packet, and I won't go into detail. We will take a vote that evening. Uh, as uncomfortable as that is, voting right in front of the people who are up for the position. Um, and again, that person will serve the remainder of the term that they're filling. Um, did any of my colleagues have anything else they wanted to offer relative to that? Yes, Mr. Steinberg. Um, I'm not sure where you ended up on the, one of the points that you brought up. I had uh, sort of raised this issue in a um, communication just to Mr. Slaughter but serve until the next local election. I thought it should end after that word election because, in fact, um, until March 27, when the, after the vote on March 27, we won't know, and even then we won't know the date mm -hmm. because um, the way the proposed charter is, assuming, you know, in the scenario of it passing, there are actually two possible election dates in the charter. There's a November date if we are able to obtain special legislation approved by the legislature and the governor, or it's a date, I believe in January, is an alternative date. So um, to put any date in there would seem to be either be unduly complicated and unnecessary or inaccurate. So I would suggest just 
um, after the word next local election period and leave it at that. I think that's sufficient. So that's one recommendation. Uh, I'm assuming that the date that we're talking about, April 2nd, has been uh, discussed with the um, Housing Authority Board. And uh, it has. Okay, that's helpful. And then there was that one other thing that we had, um, the word um, preceding after 645. Yeah. And that's taken, can be right. taken care of. Right, and that's why I yeah. read it as during, because I think technically you're correct, it is, it is during the meeting. I just to point that out. Yeah. Right. Um, it's a deletion of words. It hasn't been noticed yet. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I made three other edits that Ms. Pupple made right away when I sent them to her last week because she wanted to get this up um, last week and it didn't happen. And so now we can f continue to fix it. So um, that's helpful. The So it says during instead of preceding. But the problem is with that first sentence, Mr. Steinberg, is that everyone's going to think that we're talking about the March election because this is coming out prior to the March election. This should have been uploaded last week and will be uploaded any minute now um, as soon as we give the final wording to staff. And so if we say we'll serve until the next local election, uh, that the next local election is March 27th. So that's not the right answer. So how, how do we insert a phrase that makes it clear no. <laughs> that happens after March I would, I would suggest perhaps we could go with until the next local election following the um, appointment. March 27, 2018 election or something to that effect. Following the April 2nd appointment. Right. Oh, following the April 2nd appointment would work as well. Ah, that's an interesting way of doing it. After following. And I think that we can explain yes. it. Uh, she wants applicants to know, too. I want, yeah. Right. yeah. Following the April 22nd. April 2nd. April 2nd. April 2nd, 2018. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was looking at the 2018 appointment. Only. Appointment. And we'll serve until the next local election following yeah, the, April, that's clear. the April 2nd appointment. Yeah, that if works. Someone's really Thank confused you. by that. They can contact right. and get more. Right. But otherwise, because, what nor because it is indeed different than what normally happens right. in that right. normally we've done this in November, right, for somebody who's going to serve until March. And in that in fact, Mr. Yeah. Williams is in that very position this year for and example. for that seat. But this is confusing because okay. of the so I think that's timing. Good, I think so I think that works solution. very well. Covers all bases. Okay. Yes. The other thing I was going to add is I asked Ms. Pupple, and if it's, I, since I have you all here, I hope it's okay with you too. But I asked Ms. Pupple when she uploaded this to, she always includes a link to the policy even though we don't have that special book but the policy on filling elected board vacancies which is dated 2014 it has some edits that need to be done which I promised myself I'd do after <clears throat> the last two of these which I haven't done yet um, that just makes it clearer what we do they aren't changes but I would bring it back to you so that we would vote it obviously I'm not going to just do it on the fly so I said this is you know 98 percent of the way there go ahead and give people this information normally don't withhold this there's no it, there has already been one response letter that said you'll find out more when it gets closer it's like this should be provided as soon as they turn in the letter and that's always been true and I don't know why it was phrased that way that they always get this information as soon as they apply and like I said there's a little bit of tweaking to be done with it and probably once I revise it you'll be reminded of oh right here's this other thing I wanted to say about how we actually do it but 98% um, of it's already covered in here anyway there's just a little bit of tweaking I'll, to be done I'll point something out to you right now that yes, I noticed please. under the process the fourth bullet says deadline letters of interest is yes. 4 p.m. So we need right. some other phrasing that allows for other deadlines. Exactly. That's probably typically the case, but we were trying to accommodate, you right. know, uh, the AHA and, and we were trying to look the at full the membership packet. as quick as we can and that sort of thing. So uh, there may be some other nuance to the language there. Right. Um, that's one I noticed off. Well, just um, I see this is called policy, and, I, and I'm sure Ms. Brewer is probably going to do this. When you, when you revise this, this goes into that category that we did earlier this evening in the policy category where we're actually, you know, this preceded us but would be amended, a new, a new date approved but then amended. 
in whatever format we start to use for the policy documents. <coughs> this is another one. This would be going on that. It was in the book. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We are trying. We've gotten quite close. And there, one of the other things that's not mentioned in here in terms of mechanics that we would want to, that I'm planning to include in the edited version, which you obviously don't have before you tonight. Hopefully it'll be done before the second, and if it's not, honestly, we'll just do what we do and we'll get there. But um, is the idea of when people turn in their letters, that information is not, this doesn't need to be in the announcement, this is supposed to be in the policy, that when we've gone over this every time we've done it, is that we don't announce those names publicly also, we, when people call up and say, so how many people have applied so far, we don't tell them the answer to that either. It's up to the, if the person who's applied wants to tell the whole world they've applied, that's fine. That's their choice. We don't tell their names. We don't say how many there are until it's closed, and then it goes in the packet, and that's when everybody finds out what's happening. So it's not like pulling papers down at the town clerk's office. It's not that process. It's more like the CAF process. So it yes, it's right. It's closer, too. Which was by design. Yes. So it does seem like there's some grounds for confusion if it's going to be 12 noon versus our policy saying 4 p.m. So I think we should align. We adjust that for this one, yeah, the four. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think. I think the concern the, 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 was the yeah. 48 hours before the meeting and making sure to the be able to process them in time to, to get them into the packets and to <clears throat> have enough to get them into the packet and processed in that sense, which is why I think noon was, was scheduled. Suggested. Get everybody right. scheduled, yeah. Right. So I think that was the intention by the noon time. Mm -hmm. Yes. So which just goes to show that having a policy means we don't actually follow it. So <clears throat> because nobody was editing the policy to reflect that, <laughs> might I recommend in the meantime that we simply put a strike through on those two lines so that we don't change the approved date, et cetera, and that we just put it out that way rather than try I don't have time to revise this before it goes up and there's no reason not to tell people how the process works I would suggest that we just put the deadline of 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. and just have it be yeah. 4 p.m. It and change so we're consistent as how it's always yeah. been yeah I, I agree let's keep it at 4 p.m. okay and so we changed that cover memo okay yeah I, I think that's better yeah. then the it's the announcement itself that it's theoretically changing. we can't just strike something out of a policy until we change it <laughs> sorry oh watch us <laughs> <laughs> we clearly were ignoring we're it we're pretty free reeling <laughs> around here but i but, object to that um, <laughs> i think four seems fair to people too in terms right. of just you know you forget mm. and then right. you get end well, of the day when i first read it and saw the noon i understood the rationale behind it but i also was like oh i thought mm -hmm. we usually went to the end of the day makes sense. Sense. But we, have yeah, way, but we have a way to get that stuff out even if it's right after and their other stuff comes out the reality is we didn't change it staff changed it right. to but not for, uh, even though the uh, policy says fixed. that and so i appreciate that you said it. eastern time <laughs> because right. we did we have this that. problem yeah. when so somebody we, was yeah. traveling so we fit we fix this it's good it's, should be all good very so we have a few edits to that. So there may be a so need for the motion with the amendment. This week, as it is, I mean, as it is, as amended, so to speak. Right. Does someone want to make that motion? Do we really is need a motion? To, it a, we need a motion to schedule this. I mean, it no. seems, I mean, I, it's formal. Right? I'm not recalling whether we did or didn't. I don't mind reading it, but it seems like kind of bizarre. Where we don't motion some of the other things in our schedule. Well, it'd be helpful for us to make sure we capture the three changes that you've that we've made. Just make sure we're all on the same page. So, uh, the first change is at the end of the f the first paragraph after the word election. It says following the April second, two thousand eighteen appointment. The second change is at, is in the second line of the second paragraph, changing the word preceding to during. And the third change is in the um, last sentence of that for, of the second paragraph, changing 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. But, but that's not the the motion is. No, I understand. I just want to try. These right. are the Ignore three the things. Motion yeah. Right. Now. right. Yeah. Because the right. motion's wrong anyway. It says no. 7 p.m. So that's <laughs> that's correct. I, I would venture we don't need to motion this putting this on our schedule. I'm not recalling whether we. It just seems. Did or didn't the last three times we've done this. Right. I, it, no. It's fine that it showed up on the motion sheet, but I, I just think right. we make we came. I agree with those changes. We came to we, we agree on the process. This can be uploaded. We're off and running. So the reality is, these minutes aren't going to probably be ready before 
this happens on April 2nd. And that means it doesn't really matter what the motions were or were not either. As the minutes are going to have to reflect this. The minutes will eventually get done, but that's right. not going to change anything right. in terms of people's awareness just, level. Right. So it's, we're select over, board decided. But I think we're overly motioning here. <laughs> It'll show up in the so minutes. So I'm not going to make a motion. Okay. I think that's perfectly fine. I think that it's really about getting by consensus the memo to the right state, which is, I believe, where we've arrived, unless anyone has anything else to offer. And is the intention then to try and get this up? I know there's a, at least one vacation in play, but mm -hmm. to try and get this up this week. Mm -hmm. right. So long story short, for people at home, there's a, there's a seat available in the Amherst Housing Authority. If you are interested, send your letter of interest in to select board office by Thursday, March 29th, 2018, by 4 p.m. We will hold an election on April 2nd, starting at 6.45. So those are the key mm -hmm. takeaways from that. And you must be present to play. Yes. Must be present to win. Yes. That's yeah. correct. <clears throat> All right. So next on um, our agenda, uh, I'm going to, is actually a, a potential town meeting article, but we'll skip that for the moment. We have a, a person that's going to come and talk to us about that a little bit, and they're coming much later in the evening, so we'll move on. Um, we had, at our last meeting, uh, done our annual Tibet Day proclamation. And, uh, there were a couple other items that we wanted to return to, and we failed to do that last time. Um, so we're going to return to those at this point and, and just discuss a couple of things. There was a suggestion that the flag be flown for longer than a week, which is our um, sort of default amount of time that, for that. Um, we had approved a week, um, and there were a couple, I believe, other um, items. <clears throat> and so I just wanted to finish that discussion a little bit. I don't know that we need to take any action, but we, we should. Um, we might want to take an action. We might need to take an action. So we have that option available to us if we, if we wanted to. I have to find it in my packet. So if you can give me a moment to push that out. That was back in our packet. So similar materials to what we had last week were there. Um, oh, I know. I got that. Um. <clears throat> so did anyone want to offer some additional comment or suggestion regarding this? I do. Please. So I thought about this, um, and if you'll uh, bear with me, um, I, I totally understand where we were at last week, where we thought we were being asked, or I thought we were being asked for another resolution um, similar to what we had done the couple of previous years, and um, it was brought to our attention that there was actually um, more more being asked. One was the extended time for flying the flag, which I think we need to talk about as one issue, and the other was um, a request, and this was made um, by um, Thundup Zering, uh, who was before us, um, about supporting. Um, as I have that the, um, you know, just like number seven in his letter, calls uh, on the Secretary of State to fully implement the provisions of the Tibetan Policy Act of 2002, and then there's another number of subsets and to support the United States Congressional Bipartisan and Bicameral Bill. There were a bunch of things. I wasn't prepared to go research those, um, and it seemed like a lot to ask, um, and I hadn't realized that was part of the request. But as I thought about this, I remembered, um, because so that in um, 1999, our town meeting did actually pass at our annual town meeting um, Article 51 petition resolution to bet. Um, and it ha it's a long thing, and it includes asking um, Congress and our representatives to do certain things. And it just happened that at the end of that year in 1999, I had an opportunity to go to India um, and had spent, and I spent a couple of weeks at the Central Institute for Higher Tibetan Studies. There was an exchange program, a five college exchange program, and I, got, I was sort of a tag along. But as a tag along, I wanted to have some role, and I thought, I'll bring this Article 51 that we passed, and I got to present it to 
in a small group meeting with the Dalai Lama. And I thought, you know, sometimes I think these political resolutions that we do at town meeting are like kind of, why are we doing it? But it, it, it seemed to have some meaning and it seemed to support um, what the Tibetan people had gone through. And I thought, you know, what would have made more sense was to advise our petitioner before us to, to make this something that could go to town meeting because it went before, and that seemed like an appropriate place for it, you know, at the end of the warrant when we do these kinds of things. We didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't even think about it. Um, but we do have an opportunity as a select board to put this on the warrant, but have the petitioner actually carry the responsibility, should they so want to, of bringing this to our town meeting, which I think is the more appropriate place for it than here with the select board. Um, so I, so I thought of that action, and interestingly, it's the same person who had done this before the 1999 town meeting. And side note, I was very pleased that after 15 minutes, I could actually find this online, because I'm not that good at that, but um, was able to find um, Article 51, and it was the annual town meeting of April 1999. I don't know how that literally compares with the letter that we got last week in terms of support this bill and that other action, but um, that's my thinking um, on the aspect of a position we could take. We could allow this to go before our town meeting for that position or where I think it actually belongs. Oh, last thing if I might. So, um, so it's uh, having lunch in looking at things online, not related to this at all. I came across this quote from Eli Wiesel. Always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. And it seemed like taking an action, even if it was somewhat symbolic, was appropriate. Ms. Brewer? Okay, so now I'll be the horrible stick in the mud, horrible <laughs> process person. One, we didn't think of telling them. Two, I lost my mind when Mr. Slaughter attempted to have the select board sponsor the Indigenous Peoples Day article rather than having the Human Rights Commission or the students themselves bring it forward because why the select board in comparison to other things? Um, it's awkward at this point because we are short on time to, if, if we knew for sure that it was gonna be the exact same article, I hear your point. If we knew it was gonna be the same article from 1990, much as we have done, for example, with uh, non-citizen voting, it's pretty much the same article that we crank out every couple of years to make sure the legislature will ignore it again, but we keep trying. And I don't know how much more effort would have to go into this for that to happen, but we're running up on the deadlines for town meeting drafting of articles, which town council then has to review, et cetera, et cetera. And that's aside from my then feeling, so that's the logistics of getting it on the warrant, which is getting really tight now, even as a select board article. Then the other issue is once we get there, us taking a position on it one way or another because town meeting research, et cetera. But I'm trying to separate that from mm -hmm. the process at this point in terms of hurrying up and I'm digging through here looking at the de for the deadline sheet. Um, I, lo I looked it up today. Good. It's uh, technically the 13th at noon is the uh, quoted in the the date that we need to internally date. get the right because the, the uh, warrant review of motions is like the 16th and I think that allows the appropriate 16th doesn't sound right that would be no that would be the Friday right so the 13th would be a Tuesday if I'm doing math it's usually the right week from tomorrow the internal review is usually right. on the Friday and so then then the uh, so that gives a few days two and a half days to make any final edits and conversations before the group of folks get together to go over the motions at that point. Um, so I, yeah, there's just a smidge more than a week basically to sort of refine language in the largest sense. So did you have? No, I was just scratching. Oh, I thought, <laughs> I thought you were. I'm not at the corner of your eye. <laughs> okay, no, no. no. 
a legitimate scratch. Right. Does, um, so speaking of uh, Human Rights Commission, who would be a logical sort of participant, does anyone know if they're meeting anytime soon? Maybe in the next few days? They just had a meeting. They just had. Then we, and if they don't get a quorum, then it doesn't happen. Right. Like, I think, well, So it, it, it is atypical, but I think it also, there's a few sort of contributing factors that might make it not unheard of for us to put something like this on the warrant, but I, I think the real critical piece is, you know, in glancing sort of at the copy you had with you, it was fairly lengthy. So I don't know if we we could get so, it well, shaped in time if ourselves. If I could offer that if we were inclined to do this, then myself or somebody here would contact uh, Mr. Serring and say, this is what we're thinking. We had the conversation at our next meeting after you were here. You would need to get us something to look at and we would entertain putting it on a, uh, as our article, but understand that you would be make you know, you or your designee would be the presenter. I mean, we'll introduce the motion, but, and explain the timing and um, they would kind of carry the water on it. It's just, it's an idea and it just seemed worth pursuing at this point. Okay. I know it's out of the ordinary. I'm open to hearing anything. not said anything because I don't have, first of all, I wasn't here last week and was not part of that conversation and uh, don't have particularly strong feelings about it. Um, I've always, I've, is, uh, the, to the extent that I feel awkward about it is that I've been one who's been saying when Petition articles come up that are of this nature that the select board ought to not even take a position to recommend or not recommend. And then here we're in a position of sponsoring. And there seems to be a little bit of an inconsistency in that. You said that so succinctly. <laughs> if we did this it would we would somehow have to feel comfortable with the fact that the next person who comes to us tomorrow and says you know this was a really cool idea i had and you didn't yeah, i missed the deadline and would you please put it on for me and we're gonna have to say yeah this is different and so that's why sometimes it's easier to be like oh the deadline is the deadline i do also understand that we didn't how do i phrase this we didn't really have anybody who read the original request and understood what it was asking for. And I'm not sure how we could address that in future in terms of fixing that. So an attempt to fix it would be to say, we would have told you to go to town meeting. We may or may not have taken a position on it, but had the timing been different, we might have thought to tell you to go to town meeting for a resolution and then we could have that other conversation about later about whether or not the select board's mm -hmm. taking a position. So we could look at it as a faux pas on our part if we wanted to. I guess that I could put it in that box and feel okay about it. Although I think when we did get the letter, it was after the deadline anyway for petition articles. So we wouldn't have had that opportunity, which is just uh, many, this and other um, things of this nature have often kind of come in without people really understanding the full process. So, you know, to, to fully explore this, it would have been, even if we had thought of it, the minute we got the letter, I think it was past the deadline. Well, Monday, last Monday at noon was the deadline for resolutions. Uh, oh, what was the date on the letter? That 21st. So it would have been time. Yeah, depending on when we actually got it and well, somebody I, read it. it. The, no, but right. theoretically. So theoretically. Okay, so then I so stand corrected. So that makes you feel a little better? Well, it makes me feel like, you know, because we weren't on top of it. I didn't, I didn't really read it until that night. I, I saw, you know, kind of a quick read through my packet. So um, I think we all missed that, and, it, and there could have been time to get back. So that's my proposal. Um, I would be prepared to make a motion, but I'm not going to make one if you think it's a terrible idea. 
And it may not even be emotion. It might be an understanding we have of what we're doing. Right. It's not date stamps, so I don't know when we got <laughs> <laughs> just uh, just go by go by the date on the thing plus two days and then you still you're still in. <laughs> right. I'm not sure exactly when it was received, but um, yeah, I think we're in a bit of a pickle to say the least yes. about this. Um, there's no elegant solution on any front. Um, I think we're in. Uh, I think it's difficult. I think I, I think we may create more problems for ourselves in other ways. Um, to move ahead with a with with a warrant article, uh, you know, if we had, um, you know, if if it was something we could suggest to the, you know, the uh, Human Rights Commission, we might have a, a little bit of an avenue for them to potentially turn this over in a fairly quick time. But I don't think we really do. What's that? I'm sorry. I'm mumbling. I just no. said we couldn't count on them being able to. We could suggest. right. I mean, there's other complications, of course. Um, so I think it's going to be a little difficult to do that. Um, uh, you know, to our credit, however, we did pass, you know, in, or not pass, but we, you know, um, made the proclamation last week. We will still, you know, fly the flag uh, for the week following on and following the 10th of, of March. Um, and I think we've made clear our, our sympathy to the, to the, um, uh, Folks that, that reached out to us about this, uh, you know. Um, however, I think you know, could we have done it better? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that you know we'll potentially put that in our things to do better next time category. I think, unfortunately, I I, I just think the complications around um, the precedent setting that as Ms. Brewer brought up is is a little bit difficult. Um, so I think it's a little. Because it does put us in an odd spot. Because I, I, you know, in general, agree that there are oftentimes those kind of resolutions where I think, you know, it's fully and wholly town meetings, you know, right and responsibility to decide what it decides, and our opinion isn't necessary or important for that. But I guess I'm scratching my. I'm just trying to. Re I, I understand about if we do this, then it's hard to say no the next time something like this happens, and I'm trying to um, recall if we've done something like this in the recent past, and I don't mean, you know, like before any of us, have we done something similar? So in indigenous people, was that an exception, <coughs> or did that come through <coughs> human rights? Or so it, it, it turned out that, that in that circumstance, um, and it really wasn't that I was, uh, you know, they asked for some advice about how to do some things, and so as far as submitting the petition, I actually had my name attached to it, which made it a bit, and I was on select board at the time, so it made it a little uh, awkward. awkward in that regard, because yeah. it would have been better had, had it, someone else petitioned. It came in, and it, in, it was just a citizen. Yeah, it was just a regular citizen position. Can petition, anyone yeah. remember something in the, you know, in the last five years where something like this came in and we made an exception because of timing or it couldn't get on unless blah, blah, blah. Yes. So, no, that was the one that came to mind. But that doesn't mean it's not possible and that I've conveniently forgotten about it because I've tried to repress it. I don't know. Um, but, and, and I'm just remembering the first draft warrant that had Mr. Slaughter's name as the petitioner. And I was like, what? <laughs> but that was, that was a while Mostly out of convenience, ago. I signed it. Exactly. It wasn't a timing issue like this. It wasn't the same. And, but it is, you know, what is the select board sponsoring? And some select boards don't take that responsibility very seriously, and the community understands that they just put things on, and other communities like ours, this particular select board, is very firm about what kinds of things we put on there, and then later what kinds of positions we take. So complicated. Um, what's the timeliness of, because I have not delved into this, what's the timeliness of this issue happening this spring? I mean, I know there's a particular anniversary. Right, the, the 59th anniversary yes. of the uprising, but right. um, I don't, I don't know in terms of like taking having the rest of it. Dele you know, legislative delegations contacted to take positions. Is there something up? I, I, I don't, I don't know. That would. I think I felt like um, I wanted to bring this forward and at least give us the opportunity to consider this possibility and sort of kind of look at it in all directions, but. I, I certainly understand the dilemma when you make an exception because 
you know, sort of heartfelt sympathy reason, which, does, which you know, the next thing is, you know, you know, volleyball day or something that you don't care about. And it's easy, you know, that, so you can't just stick up for the ones you like, but I, I think there are some really important principles in the material and what's being asked for. However, if we don't have a way to accommodate it, we don't, and I wish we had had more of an extended conversation with that, um, the petitioners, applicants, prior before it even got to select board. So I guess I would ask a question and then possibly put it into then a different frame. When you looked at the article from was 1999, was the um, substance of the article similar to the resolution as presented this year as far as the issues raised and the steps to be taken in support? Uh, well, the actual article that was passed, or what it was, it wasn't asking the select board, it was. Um, it was just a direct uh, resolution. Is, um, the article, um, I guess it's a resolution when it talks about certain actions, and, you know supports the 1997 <laughs> International Committee of Jurists recommendations that the People's Republic of China, and then it tells the People's Republic of China what to do. I mean, you know, it's, it's different than it's the different, series but it's of similar we, themes. Yeah, but it's different than the specific support this bill and support that bill that we got, which I thought we don't, I don't have the attention to go really research those and then come and say, if we took this position, it would mean we were supporting X, Y, Z. Um, so it, it's mm -hmm. sort of, it's similar in flavor, but different. In, in okay, no, I, I'd have to take your word for it. I yeah. can't read it I, now. I mean, I read it really quickly before coming here, but yeah. So that's, I mean, I'll think, you know, the fate of the world doesn't hang in the balance on this, but um, it certainly points to things I would do differently. And, right where we already had actions prior town meetings some of us if there was a way to get it on and we could have gotten it on if we had thought of it right right i agree we could have sent them on their way to get it on it would be right the timing was just bad yeah. so whichever way we decide how would we communicate that because we told the applicant that we would take it up at a subsequent time and then let them know because they they left saying we still want we, we would still like you to do xyz action right so unless someone offers a motion then i think uh one of us and it could be me since i'm the chair i can certainly reach out um and let them know that that we did did not change our motion um and nonetheless we were you know in the since of this conversation about where we were with regard to that and, and um, you know, sort of potential options for the future. Right, to highlight that we would be happy to work with them next year if they want to do Right. So, you know, all other things being equal, we right. don't know, Absolutely. but to help with that. Right, and, and I agree that, you know, often, you know, folks that aren't in this every day don't recognize those deadlines sneak up as, as early as they are in a lot of ways, and so it, it uh, I think, you know, you think, oh, town meetings at the end of April, but yet the deadline for petition articles is the end of February, two full months ahead of time. So it's a pretty long timeline ahead of time. Yes. So just two things. One is, um, although we don't typically do resolutions at fall town meeting, there's nothing forbidding them. And That's so true. if there is a new piece of legislation, for example, like mm -hmm. an update to something mm -hmm. here, if it seems timely right. to the petitioners, then that would be worth pursuing something. For we the, do feel confident there will be a town meeting in the fall. Whereas there will be. We don't right. know about the annual. Right. Right. And so that could be appropriate for them as, as well, particularly depending on how things unfold mm -hmm. over the legislative session, which they'll know by the summer to some right. extent, and then they'll be able to consider what they want for the fall with still plenty of time for the deadline. Right. So you could mention that to them. And then the other aspect of it 
is that, um, which we actually originally started out on and then became this much bigger issue, is the 59 days. Yeah, we, we, right. we do need to do the flag. Yeah. So we need to decide about Before that, you, too. If you're going to call the person that we need right. to answer on it. Um, These were both things we, we just, said we were going to talk about at the right. end of the last meeting, Mr. Steinberg, when you weren't here, and then we forgot and we went so, home. So <laughs> thank you for hearing me out on, on this. As, you know, if I hadn't had that personal experience, I probably wouldn't have That's helpful. gotten into it. So did someone want to uh, offer a suggestion around the 59 days? What does the book say? <laughs> the policy book. <laughs> this is going to be an ongoing joke. People Someone, are going to wonder why we're talking about um, a book all the time. I had this, that doesn't exist. Yeah, I had this exist. question, because um, in thinking about it, so somebody at our last meeting said, well, Black History Month, we, we fly the flag for a month. And I'm wondering, is that the only time that we do a month because I have no idea and then you know if we were going to develop either a practice or a policy it might be and I'm just going to throw this out maybe something like it's one week except for Black History Month but I don't know how many other exceptions mm -hmm. are out there yes so there are three flags that we typically fly one is the Tibetan flag one is the Puerto Rican flag in November and then Black History Month flag in February and how long do each of those fly the Black History flag is for a month um, Puerto Rican flag is usually November 19th. I'm not sure the duration of that. It's around a week to 10 yeah, days, I think. Days, I think. Yeah. It ends up being part of the month. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tibetan flag. It's been a week in the past. I would like to standardize it to a week, except for Black History Month, because we've been doing that, and it's, a, it's to honor the month, and that could be the one exception. Because, say, next year we have, maybe this summer, we have three flag requests for different things. Like, how do we know? We're just plucking these numbers out of the air. Right. And we did the POW one, or that's no one that's always. there forever. Okay. That doesn't. That's right. not that's our not purview. Ours. Okay. To me, a, a week, except for the exceptions, is a decent guideline. So it sounds like we need policy for the book. <laughs> um, but in the meantime. <clears throat> We could say in the minutes that our practice for now is a, we expect our practice to be a week. We will someday draft such a thing. Except and, for. And then people can ask. You know, if they, there's a special anniversary or whatever, it's not unreasonable oh. to ask. It's just that, you know. But what about Black History Month, which we're already doing? A right? week other than Black History Month because, okay. you know, it's so a month. Let's, huh? call, let's call that out because that's, that has been our practice yes. is to do that month. So that's it. Everything else yep. is going to be equal except that. We've had a child abuse prevention flag in the past. I mean, different flags, you know, go through different cycles right. of popularity and attention that people pay to them. It gives some consistency. Yeah. Okay. So we'll let the minutes reflect that, and I'll convey that in the message to the to the. Do you uh, need a motion or a practice so we can just agree that that's our practice in the I, minutes? I think that. How would Mr. Buckman like to write that in the minutes? <laughs> Since he can do it however he likes. Yeah, I mean, I have the practice. The practice of the board is to fly a flag for a week, except in the case of Black History Month. I think that. Is a I, think that's, I think that is fine. Yeah, longstanding yeah. tradition as well. Right, and I think yeah. if if we wanted to get to the place of a formal policy, it would require we'd probably have to think a little deeper about it than than that, just in case there's a set of criteria we want to apply or whatever the case. Codified may be. it in some minimal. Way. Right. Right. All right. So I'll make sure to reach out to them in the next few days and sort of uh, convey our our uh, uh, conversation to them. So again, um, we're waiting on uh, someone to come to talk to us about uh, 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 4E, so we'll move on to uh, other parts of our agenda. Um, uh, under committee boards, appointments, and reappointments, we have confirmed the town manager's appointment of a couple of folks. Um, did you want to introduce this at all? In, in any sure. Um, questions or? So there are two people who have applied to, excellent people who have applied for the Water Supply Protection Committee, um, Jack Jemsek and Christina Sanfranito. Uh, and this, the recommendation is to appoint them through uh, June 30th, 2020. Jack is a currently a member of the planning board. And um, Ms. Sanfrani, um, the spelling is wrong. Um, is a professor at of hydrology at Hampshire College. 
both really uh, well suited for this position, these positions. And I think there's a still an, another vacancy on that committee. No, there were two. That's it. I just, and Mr. Jemsik, not in addition to being a planning board member, is a hydrogeologist. Yes, yes. <laughs> We'll get oh so the T oh, it's two the T O at the end of her name in our motion sheet needs to come off. Correct. Oh, is that the Yes. It was two, That's the word two having... was to follow oh, her name I, and it ended oh, up getting two, merged. Two. <laughs> it got merged to her name. Yeah, it's a typo. Cian Frani is the is the actual name. Right. That's what happened. Yeah, I didn't I was like, how did that oh like... So if someone would like to um, make a motion? Certainly. I couldn't do that. Or on behalf, sort of on behalf of Mr. Bachman, because he can't make motion. I move to confirm the town manager's appointment of Jack Jemsick and Christine um, Cian, Ciafrani to the Water Supply Protection Committee through June 30th, 2020. Second. All right, so we have a motion to the second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so that's unanimous. And so if you'd like to okay. get into the next one. Mm -hmm. And we have a vacancy um, on the planning board, and uh, we interviewed two people for that vacancy, both uh, high quality people. And uh, the recommendation is uh, for David Levenstein of 100 Woodside Avenue to be appointed uh, through June 30th, 2020. Uh, Mr. Levenstein is a uh, attorney and uh, the person who had been on the on the planning board, uh, Mr. Rosnoy, had been an attorney, and that was a skill set that they were eager to replace. Okay. And uh, I do note that uh, he stated that um, his the nature of his practice will not pose a conflict. Correct. <coughs> totally different kind of. Law. So I would like to move to confirm the town manager's appointment of David Levenstein to the planning board through June 30, 2020. There's a second? Second. All right. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Unanimous. Um, if I could just add a, a little footnote, because we've, we've said something like this many times before, but um, since I was the uh, select board person participating in these, I'm again kind of um, astounded with the high caliber of people who we have to draw on. Um, for our committees and that they um, come forward and volunteer their time and that they're um, highly skilled and respected in their fields. And um, it just sometimes amazes me. And people I, I, you know, there's like, I didn't know you were here. And then, you know, um, they step up and it's, it's really um, kind of inspiring. Thank you. So next on our agenda, um, We'll move into uh, section seven, which is licenses, public land, meter, parking reservations. Um, we have a consent calendar, but I'm going to suggest that we pull out the res reservation metered parking for the sustainability fair on April 14th, 2018, for a couple of reasons. One of which is um, I believe we received a memo, maybe on our desk it tonight. On, it was on our desk. The one on our desk tonight has the 22nd or the 21st as the date. And mm -hmm. so I just want to make sure that that's not the date. <laughs> um, and so yeah. we want to sure be enough. clear on the date that we we are approving and the locations we are approving which I think are actually identified correctly um, that's a problem because what, what is the date yeah the memo of February 27th says the 14th and the memo of March 1st says the 22nd so clearly it's the 14th that, the 14th the 20 that was a cut that's a 2017 letter. 2017 right that's oh, that even one? though it's March it's a 2017 letter <coughs> we have on our desk tonight right so, that was pulled oh, out that may be so that's why it is indeed the 14th. but we oh. needed to pull it out for other reasons anyway, yeah. so it's I think that's okay. from last year's so that's not yes yeah yes. correct that's, that's to show what you did last year right that's why it's there. All right. It's my confusion. Oh, oh, but there isn't even a date so, on this one. So may I? Please. So I sent a note to Mr. Bachelman that said, as we have said, whenever we get a parking request, we need to be clear on what's different than the last time we did it. I don't care what they want 
per se. I want to know what's different. And farmers market everybody. And so he went back to Ms. Ciccarello to, to, and to staff to dig that up. And that's why we all got confused when we glanced at this memo, because this is like really timely, except a year ago, right, <laughs> March of 2017, so talking about what they had last year. And, but Ms. Ciccarello made it quite clear in the memo of March yep, of today. February. March 5th, 2018, this afternoon, there's an email that's on the top here oh, right. that she provided to us that says it's still the 21 spaces, which you can confirm by looking back at that old letter. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, it's the four spaces on the south side for electric vehicle test drives. The Spring Street parking lot. Right. So. So having said that, do you still think that it should be separated from the consent motion? Um, well, I think the main thing I want to do is make sure that we were clear on that. And I had misread the old no from a year ago. <laughs> oh, right, and said that's um, <coughs> But uh, so it does not need to be uh, separate from, from the uh, consent calendar. Um, I will just say once again on the microphone that the sustainability fair is April 14th. And people should all come down and uh, enjoy it. So, and you. test drive an electric vehicle. And potentially test drive an electric yeah. vehicle. And you wanted, you said at the um, beginning of the evening that you wanted under D to not include um, and May 10, 2018 yes. in the first floor. That correct. Eight. Correct. If you would exclude that from a motion, that would be, or it would be as a, as amended, and that would be the amendment that I would suggest that we have. So everything after that semicolon that starts with the words and May 10, 2018, through the end. Yes. Well, there's no field director stays on there, but otherwise, yes. Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, the way it's sort of structured oh. is uh, uh, Ms. Fontaine oh, was the, the one who had right. signed the prior ones and she but I think that Ms. Nofia had only signed that one mm -hmm. so, okay that's correct um, that's why it would seem to be appropriate yes so with that noted as what the amendment is the, that particular deletion then I move to approve the items listed on the consent calendar for March 5 2018 as amended is there a second okay. here's a second is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so that takes care of that section of things. So I think what we'll do now. I yes. ask a quick question just to, to verify that we have every intention of making sure the March 5th memo that we just got this afternoon ends up in the packet upload eventually. Yes, please. Would be so the that next year it's right there <laughs> when somebody right. goes back to look it up to tell us not me looking it up but staff tells us right that's what the difference is right it'll be great so i think at this time uh we'll move into uh the town manager's report mm -hmm. if you're sure if you're ready to uh, take us through so we're not so later t i'm sorry i wasn't recognized yes so later tonight are we going to talk about the other we are okay yeah, we are. The person oh, it's no. coming is. No, no, no. I'm talking about the other alcohol license that we pulled out of the oh. consent calendar because this is different than the other alcohol license Correct. we pulled out of the consent calendar last time. So, so I can address that. Yes. So, so we did not get a, a member raised questions about that um, license and we could not get the answers to that okay. since it's not till May 10th. There was adequate time. There's adequate time for us so to bring it's it back postponed. to you. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. Right. Okay. Right. right. Sorry. I didn't. Thank you. you need to jump ahead there. That's why you we pulled it out. It might have been before Ms. Brewer came, or was it after? So, so the other thing that I will mention is that last week we pulled one out for a similar reason, right? And that one has subsequently been uh, withdrawn. 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 So, oh, right. So the one we pulled out last week was withdrawn, and then we've got a new one this week to pull out for some more detail, mm -hmm. and we'll deal with it when it comes up. Because there's plenty of time. Because there's lots of time. So I was not at last week's meeting. I did watch portions of it, and um, and uh, one thing that was said during that discussion had to do with open container um, law, and um, being on the campus and community coalition, this actually came up in regard to the subject of um, 
tailgating at football games and it turns out that on campus there is no open container provisions and um, that was one of the issues that was um, discussed because as a town we do and um, there seems to be some misunderstanding that people can have open containers at tailgating because it is allowed on campus but it is uh, um, not allowed on town streets and people would migrate to town streets and uh, it's the uh, so I just thought I would throw that in to further cloud the issue <laughs> to further cloud the issue exactly what we needed because Open container drifting if you wouldn't mind Mr. Slaughter Please. because in case there was something else that somebody else wanted to ask about along those exact lines so what I asked Mr. Bachelman to look into was the way they were planning to as we talked about last time controlled space so how do you keep people in the tent and tell them they can't take their alcohol outside the tent because for example if you license a premise I know one day liquor licenses are different but in terms of some form of consistency right. if you have a if you have a restaurant that doesn't have an outdoor licensed premise they can't just take it out on the sidewalk or out back or even for the example patio. in Hadley Wildwood barbecue they have a nice picnic area it's not a licensed premise so they can't take it out of the building right. and so that's one issue and then of course it being an open campus where people walk their dogs etc how is it that it's set aside from just people wandering in and buying alcohol and wandering off <laughs> and so um, I appreciate them wanting to use their outside but uh, thinking that through a little bit would be helpful for us to understand that they've had that conversation with Chief Livingstone and it's begin the beginning of the season for commencement activities like this. So I think we want to get as many of these processed through, but make sure we're all on the same page on this. So, okay, your, your report. Yeah, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, go ahead. And I don't want to make more work for any of us, but I wonder, you know, we get a lot of these, I've never met these people <coughs> who are the, the managers of and the submitters of. I wonder if there could be some small face-to-face -face meeting where we say, hey, we're getting these, when, when we get them, these are the kind of questions we think of and have a conversation. How, how would you, how were you thinking of managing this kind of outdoor event? And these are the kind of things we'd like assurance and have some exchange it's early in the season because we, we get these and we, we kick them out and we send them back, but we, we never have that conversation. It just, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be all of us, but. I think that under the circumstances that we are talking about the university, which is an entity that we have a sort of unique relationship with in many different ways, um, the conversation with them should be a general one um, about how uh, they um, monitor such events and um, what their approval process is internally and their monitoring process, but it, it, it's a little bit different from some of the others, which is why I think that um, it might be also worth asking Chief Livingstone um, what he does um, for signing off on the ones that are actually on campus and are really campus events and uh, whether there should be somebody like in the university um, police that we uh, check with um, to make sure that I mean, that's one idea you know that's one one possibility but um, as Ms. Brewer helps us to develop new policies <laughs> just another add-on yes yeah, exactly. but it just I, I just feel weird that we get these, and in a way they're anonymous to me, and we have these conversations. I don't expect them to watch the tapes of these meetings or <laughs> figure it out. So we're at the beginning of the season, and maybe there's a constructive way to have a discussion. Yeah, so, so I think the people who deal at the university, they all funnel through one office, and then they come to our office, and there's a single point of contact at their end because they manage this process, mm -hmm. and that, that's a pretty, they and they are checking back and forth with Ms. Puppel and Ms. Boyson a lot. So there, there is a sort of a pretty, we try to expedite it for their search for, because we have three or four of these every week. Mm. Um, and so there's pretty, pretty um, a, a paved path between the two. So, but I think the, the expectations are, are, are 
it goes back and forth. But you know, if you wanted to meet with people or have them come to the CCC or whatever, I'm not sure what is what you're really looking for um, for one day liquor licenses. What is our czar of all things alcohol <laughs> say? <laughs> it's so nice. Um, you know, the alcohol task force. Yeah, that that didn't quite turn out the way some of us expected um, in terms of making a difference to our everyday lives. Um, I'm sure it, may, it will make a difference to some of the producers of, of beverages. But that aside, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish here, right, what are, what are we trying to do? Mm -hmm. And I feel like on the one hand, we sometimes treat these, oh, they're just a one day, who cares? But we have all these conversations at Campus Community Coalition. We have all these standards about we don't want to have signs everywhere about alcohol use. But yet, ironically, our wonderful partners say they have to have alcohol at every fundraising event. So it, it's awkward for us to both care and not care, um, to trust them and to, and to not worry about it. So yes, it's one days are different, but no one I don't believe at the state level expects us to churn out as many one days as we do with UMass. That's just not what the expectation was for one day liquor licenses. So um, I have one of the other things we might consider exploring is when in, several years ago, prior to this alcohol task force uh, coming about, a catering license became available under certain circumstances. And I mentioned that to the person who now is no longer there, who was sending us, who was being listed as manager. And the reason they would list different managers is because they're only allowed legally to list the same manager X number of times a year. So they list different managers. And it would cost them less money to get the catering license, and we wouldn't have to be handling these all the time. And to some extent, I guess it would be out of sight, out of mind if they got the catering license. So, you know, I'm not, we're not trying to be difficult here. We're just trying to, you know, talk about the values we say we have when we talk about all the other things we're doing and take our work seriously. But, you know, it's a huge amount of paperwork shuffling at this point, and I'm not sure that we're getting as much that we can feel like we feel entirely confident about it, barring some conversation where we all have some great agreement as to how things are gonna work. I just don't know where that conversation has yeah. to happen. It's, I don't think it's gonna happen with the people whose names you see here mm -hmm. necessarily. Yeah, it's it's, necessarily. These are bigger yeah. things that are, if you wanna have that conversation, I'm not sure who, yeah. who we have that conversation and with. Just to, Ms. Barrett, that won't really take place at a CCC meeting. I mean, when we say our partners, I mean, the university is even more bureaucratic than the town trying to, I mean, there's different layers. So, yeah, it's the university, but it's not the part that we're doing all this kind of proactive work with. Um, it kind of happens, you know, off screen somewhere else. Yeah, I think that uh, one of the things that we, we understand is that we have criteria that we're looking for. We want to make sure that there's no service to, of any kind, to people who are under the age of 21, that we expect that uh, they will have professional um, people involved with the sale and delivery of alcohol so that there's no underage sales and there's no sales to people who are obviously intoxicated at the time that they're purchasing, that they have some system of monitoring the establishment to make sure that purchasers of alcohol are not uh, wantonly distributing then the uh, alcohol to other people, that if it is a closed event um, by invitation, uh, it. Um, is different than an open event and um, what, that we'd like to make sure that appropriate steps are being taken. I don't think we necessarily want to approve all of the steps, but it might be worth just codifying what our expectations are and then just sending them to people who apply saying we've approved it, but it is approved. Can, with your, but with your understanding that these are the policies that attach to all of our approvals. Do you want to draft that? Yes. I believe that comes back to the post-election conversation. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but also, the, and, and that would actually fit in terms of the way we do other processes where, for example, it says restrictions. And this talks about 
bottles and cans, which is totally out of date, and no one mm. didn't know. Everyone knows it's not actually true, and so we could have a thing that was actually true. <laughs> that was what our actual expectations were, right. and our actual rules that went with this form. But we have not been willing to dive into fixing this form because, in many ways, it's the conversation about what to put in the rules and then have the rules and then just have that be clear and we know <coughs> agreeing to by applying. Well, I like, I like Mr. Steinberg's idea where before we do the full blown, if we ever do rewrite or development of an alcohol policy, that we just have kind of a one pager of these are, you know, this is our expectation that goes with that. It's sort of the, the handout, and that helps clarify it. But getting getting to that, and maybe that does wait, and, you know, until next month, which <laughs> dates for the other things. Right. Yeah. So I like that idea. So can we put that on that Google Doc <laughs> of the future? The, the one you revived, which is is not only I know the alcohol policies are surely on there already, but in terms of the Arguably, we could start attacking that by rather than doing the whole policy, which is going to have a lot of different layers to it, is fixing the one day issue first. Because you know, we but, can change it again. Right. If including we don't like an it. Attach a descriptive attachment. Right. That takes away restrictions that aren't actually true and that has real things. I agree to this. Just like when people reserve the common, I agree. I understand I may have to pay for police. I understand I have to clean up. You know, I have to do those things. This should should not be different than that. So if we could find a way to call that the one day license um, revision, revision and sure. values agreement. It's like a compact. Expectations, Expectations was the word I was writing down. but Or guidelines or something like that. Because we could do that and that would help us figure out the bigger policy issues, maybe yeah. be a, a baby step. And it would be a start getting the policy work done. Cool, thank okay. you all. Now, would you like to? <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. That really uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I um, uh, have to acknowledge that I've accepted the resignation of Claire McGinnis, who is our treasurer collector. She has been the treasurer collector and lately a co interim finance director since 2004. She started as the collector, then continuing on as treasurer collector in 2010. And then most recently, after Mr. Pooler left, was uh, elevated along with um, Ms. Aldrich to be co-interim finance director. Um, in her resignation letter, she said, with the support and hard work of the team in my office, we managed the adoption of new procedures and the use of technology to work more efficiently uh, in billing, collecting, and investing the funds of the town while contemporarily adhering to the high standards of integrity and respect established by her predecessors and peers. Um, she's been a tremendous um, asset for the town, uh, very, very talented. Uh, you've seen her in action when she's made presentations to town meeting and to um, boards and, and here um, in front of you individually as well. Uh, she'll be greatly missed. Uh, we have a, um, and so I wish her really the best, and uh, she has a, a bright future in front of her uh, moving forward. Um, and I've tried to offer her opportunities to stay here, but she was pretty um, clear about seeking another direction in her professional career. So we benefited her from her uh, experience and her professionalism for 14 years, so we're very grateful for that um, and hope that she does even better in her next position. Um, and that we have a, um, a transition plan in place, and Claire has been instrumental in helping us uh, organize that. Uh, existing staff will be um, asked to step up as the assistant collector and the assistant treasurer will be full, fulfilling their functions. We're taking all the actions necessary to transition bank accounts, um, Department of Revenue, s signature pages, things like that. Um, so, and so we're moving forward on that. On this position, along with, as you know, the town clerk's position and the assistant to the town manager's position, I'm holding until after the election before we move forward on that. There are many opportunities available when there are so many high-level positions uh, in play for us to conceptualize where we want to go as a town. Um, my goal is always to uh, 
sort of like zero based budgeting look at do we need the positions at at that level that we have um and are there uh, the opportunities to give growth to people internally and also to combine positions where we can be more efficient for this um because we have so many vacancies on the first floor i'm thinking of bringing somebody in to really do an evaluation of our existing staffing models uh, we have a lot of experienced people and there's going to be transition coming in the next you know five ten years and so i think it's really a good idea to have someone from the outside come in look at how we're laid out the, the kinds of activities we're doing the kind of resources we're allocating to each of these activities um what sh what's being internalized what we're doing internally what sh what could be farmed out uh, for instance uh ms mcginnis had already um, taken the step of uh, migrating our ambulance billing systems to a, a um, third-party vendor because uh, our experience and my experience individually has been that that you get greater um, uh, collection rates and more efficient billing uh, rates and uh, we were able to do that without by utilizing vacancies in other positions so that the person who is doing that function will is, is will be moving to a new new position and she's pleased with that option so we do these things um, with a long-term view. We don't, we're not just jumping to do things to do things. Um, so I think that, uh, well, she lives a very big hole in our operations. I think that um, there's some opportunity, all these opportunities that come with, with something like this. So we're thinking about it very critically. Uh, I will be probably looking to bring somebody in from the outside who will really sit down with each person who's doing the jobs and sort of listen to the types of activities and the amount of time they spend on things. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of talent on the first floor uh, that we um, can tap into, so I'm really pleased with that. And people have been really good, both within the Treasury Collector's Office and outside the office to say, we'll help whatever needs to be done. Um, so I'm optimistic because, you know, as you've heard me say many times, there's a lot of talent in this town, as Ms. Kruger said, just in the volunteers, but also on the staff. We are an employer of choice, so people who come here tend to stay, and they are always looking for new opportunities, and we're, we're trying to accommodate that. So sad that that's happening, but um, wish Claire the best. Um, her last day is March 16th, so we're moving very aggressively to um, get everything done that needs to be done. Could you remind us of the dates on the other two? Um, positions that you just reminded us of which so it's for the town clerks I think it's June 30th uh, and for Miss Puppel is June 10th it's hoping it was a little bit further out. yeah yeah they, they're <laughs> there there's there's Ooh. time and we, we have a, a schedule for our sort of recruitment for those positions once um, the Charter and I've talked with some people about these positions and they do want to know well what what's your form of government and it only makes sense and so we want to know that too um, so we're looking forward to the answer Thank you. Um, the uh, other uh, big news was the events of March 3rd uh, which was Saturday and um, and that day went very well and from my perspective uh, we had um, a large number of uh, police officers from municipal other municipalities along with our entire contingent uh, with a fully staffed fire and EMS service um, the university was staffed up the university has taken some really tangible um, strong steps that have influenced what is happening on that traditional day of parties and, and specifically, I think their uh, guest policy and their parking policy is very um, aggressive in terms of no outside visitors are permitted, no um, non-UMass vehicles are permitted in their parking lots. So they, um, that's been very important because what I think was found last time was that it wasn't necessarily university students who were causing a lot of the um, uproar. Um, it was people who were coming here for the party, not students. Um, and they also um, put on a concert every year. And this year's uh, the uh, acts, the entertainers that they got were high end, selected by the students uh, in consultation with the administration. And there's a lot of buzz about the, the uh, three performers that they had hired to come in and that generated a lot of interest. I think there were nearly 5,000 tickets given to university students. Um, 
the concert, the doors opened of the Mullen Center, opened at 11, the concert started around noon, it ended around 3.30, and when we were looking at for the reports after that, most of the students who had attended that were hungry, and they went back to the tiny commons and tired and went back to the dorm. So uh, we weren't sure what would happen at that moment, but it turned out to be pretty well done. Uh, on the town side, our party registration program is a, was a huge success, and um, we had 55 parties registered. Um, I don't have all the reports on everything that happened, but um, having that information in the system, uh, the operations, I mean, I, I just wish I wrote to you over the weekend, I wish you had, could have seen the, um, the management of Captain Gunderson, uh, the police chief, uh, the organization of hundreds of um, people who were in um, in the building. If you saw a lot of police cars at the middle school, that's where they organized themselves first thing in the morning and then they deployed. The concept was to have high visibility throughout the community uh, with you know, wearing yellow jackets and uh, engage with students. <coughs> the messaging to all the people who were, who were here um, was to engage the students, be respectful for the students, encourage them to have fun, but to also pay attention to things that might create a danger, such as uh, there were things like there were 30 people on a roof of a porch. They would ask them to get down, and, and the students were generally compliant. Um, when there'd be a large gathering, uh, some, there was some education that had to be done of the um, police officers from other communities because they would see a gathering of 50 or 100 and think, oh my goodness, and our officers who were pretty experienced with that said, that's okay, we can, we, we can handle more than that. Um, the way they set it up is they have, will have a, a group of um, officers from one community and then they'll have some Amherst police officers with them. So there's some cog contact. Uh, communication uh, was really important. The state um, police were here. They had technology that they uh, had loaned to the town. Uh, MEMA had brought in communication. Tech communication is a very important thing because there's so many people on radios and being able to communicate is very important. Um, but just the level of organization, the level of communication, um, the Emergency Operations Center, our, our IT department was pivotal in getting everything up and running, getting everybody communicating. Um, it's just really impressive and just I uh, wanna thank everybody who contributed to it because it was, you know, it was police, it was fire, DPW had extra staff on, on, on hand in case it was a street sweeper in case we needed that, with barricades in case we needed that. Uh, PVTA was, was available to us, uh, a lot of planning. And the way they laid it out is uh, there's a, a really detailed operations plan that was um, laid out. Um, they say their operations plan starts in September when they start to engage in students and start, and start to build the relationships. Um, and then phase two is the day where they continue to engage students. And so it builds on the work that was done since September. And then they're also prepared in case things go the wrong way. And they're, so they have looked at all the contingencies. Um, just very impressive. Um, it's the value of a professional, well-trained police department is just, um, you can't under, underestimate that. Uh, they also have had uh, police departments in here that they've uh, brought in. Um, and if, they, if they're not on the same page as, as our mission, they don't get invited back, and they are pretty critical about that. They're, they, any police officer that's here from any community reflects on our police department, so they care, the chief cares a lot about that. So uh, a good day. Uh, the extra costs for outside police officers is borne by the university. It does not cost the town anything. There's a lot of paperwork now that comes in, and. Um, that everybody's submitting their bills and things, and so that all has to happen now. So there's, it continues to work. Uh, the university sees this as a very high value to them. They want us to um, be at this level, and we, they will have a debrief afterwards, uh, the operations people, and talk about what went right, what went wrong, and make changes to next year. So are there any questions on that? Ms. Kruger. Um, no, that was a great report. I just, I'm thinking, I'm thinking out loud. Um, sometimes our our staff and other departments don't don't feel seen, or you, that was quite a, a, you know a commendation that you just gave, rightly so. <coughs> Is there some appropriate way that we could communicate our appreciation for that effort to the police? It could be as simple as a note that you send and mm -hmm. say that the select board, including 
the select board wanted uh, me to let you know that you know they recognize the good work and all the training yeah, sure. and That'd it be, could be your appreciation that. and ours in one kind of thing because you know town hall doesn't see what we do yeah. kind of thing and I think they'd be very very much appreciate it good idea thank you so more mundane items <laughs> um, uh, on Friday I'll be at uh, Kelly's restaurant with uh, Chief Livingstone uh, anticipating in case anything went south, he'd be there <laughs> to answer the questions. Um, <laughs> That's my spot. I should try to go to that one. So, um, and uh, so it's, it's interesting. We're starting to get more and more um, emails. This is becoming a regular thing. People say, oh, I want to meet with the town manager or else I'll just show up at one of his coffees. And you know, if they, mm -hmm. people who have complaints about a pothole or whatever it is. So it's a good thing. It's, I, I want them to come. Um, at the on, on downtown um, at the roundabout you may have seen two plywood signs and then some paper on it saying <laughs> welcome to Amherst those are not the signs that we're anticipating <laughs> they look a little shabby but it was an idea for uh, the bid put those up to sort of gauge the size location what it would look like it was really important for and to drive around have the DPW specifically drive around the police say are these going to obstruct views is this is this the location uh, when they do go into place, there will be a wall built uh, going up to them. The signs will be crafted utilizing the design that was de uh, developed by the sign committee. That was, the, But these will be um, paid for by the bid, and uh, the landscaping will be maintained by the bid. Um, the um, bid is working on a, de they would like to uh, do a design competition for the band shell on the common. And so we're starting to move forward on that. Um, they also have, um, you know, I told you last time about them going on, having sort of a retreat and having somebody come in. And they're, the bid board was very excited about the idea. They use the word plaza, that's, that's not really what they mean. I think they're thinking of a somewhat larger gathering space uh, on the North <coughs> Common. Uh, they intend to be very active participants as we start to engage the public in what the town common, the North Common should look like because um, there are options available to create a space <coughs> that, makes, that makes the area um, more conducive to, get to gatherings of people, um, seating areas, and trying to activate some of the spaces, uh, e including utilizing <laughs> some portions of the Main Street parking lot, sensitive to the loss of parking up there, but, um, uh, th but thinking through sort of holistically that whole, the whole area. Um, the the um, consultant they had brought in, his first thing he said was, you have your prime parcel in town as a parking lot. You know, it, you would think there'd be a building there or, or a park or something that was, that was um, generating activity, but that's a key parking space. It's our most popul popular parking location, so we know that people like it. Um, I've also had conversations with the bid um, about a parking garage. Um, now they are, one of the th challenges I've identified is that people talk about the need for a parking garage and they fixate on a parking garage, but we don't really have a shared sense of how much does a parking garage cost in this town. And so I've engaged in a conversation with them to say, would you pay, or maybe with the town, um, to have a consultant come in just in a brief, you know, look at our situation, say, if you put a parking garage here or there, what is the estimated cost? What kind of, how big w would it be? Um, how much <coughs> revenue would you have to generate? And just to, so we have, so, so everybody can be on the same page because I've heard uh, um, ranges of cost of a parking garage from $6,000 to, to $25 or $30,000 per parking space. And that's a big range in terms of whether we can afford to do it or if a private developer would wanna come in and do it. So trying to create, um, move beyond the um, conversation of we need a parking garage, we need a parking garage, and just that's all people are saying, and then people not really hearing that, and people, it just seems like there's this conversation happening that's, not, that's just going past each other. Um, on the social services funding, if you recall, town meeting appropriated $60,000 for social services funding, and we went out for an RFP uh, for 
Latino food security program, and we've received two bids, two proposals, um, and so uh, we are going to begin uh, conversations with um, the Survival Center, which was one of the proposals to uh, work on this. Uh, we have not signed a contract or anything like that, but the, the dollar amounts were the same for both proposals, so in the Survival Center was rated higher on, for that, so we looking forward to um, getting that program started. Uh, our health director, Julie Fetterman, is really high on this program. Uh, we had um, a, th a three-member panel that reviewed the proposals and, and ranked them. In your packet, I also have the letter from the Attorney General that has informed the town clerk that all of the articles that needed approval by the Attorney General from the November 6, 2017 meeting, including the marijuana articles, that were approved. Um, as being legal, which is really good. Um, on um, public safety issues, the, I wanted to mention that the uh, town of Hadley has work, reached out to us to have a, a follow-up conversation uh, about ambulance uh, services to their community. Um, the, yes, this is budget time, so other communities are reaching out to us. You know, we provide services to Leverage, Shrewsbury, and Pelham. And they, each of those communities pays us a, a stipend to provide the service in addition to um, the work, the, the receipts that we receive if, if, if we're able to bill for that. We don't recover all of our costs. These stipends help us to offset the cost. And it's a, I think it's a good deal for the, um, for the, three, communi the three smaller communities. Um, Hadley is 20% is of our ambulance calls, and it's something that we look at pretty critically. Um, and my basic um, philosophy going into the meeting with them is that the taxpayers of uh, Amherst should not be subsidizing the taxpayers of Hadley, that they need to be the town of Hadley, uh, and the cost of providing that service needs to be self-sufficient. And uh, that's our bottom line on, in going to meet with them. It's really important that, um, that I don't feel that our taxpayers are subsidizing a neighboring community on this particular issue, um, especially because they went out to bid and got in the market has shown that there's a, a value to the service that we provide. Um, so I will, again, working with the fire department and the EMS, uh, our EMS folks will be talking with them about the services that we provide. The services we provide we're very proud of and it's very high level services. Um, we, we have the best ambulances. We have highly trained paramedics that show up at your door uh, in a matter of minutes. It's, again, one of those things I think the town should be rightly proud of. Um, the, um, in your, I'm not sure if I put it in your packet or not. We, we did receive the letter from the state about uh, our Chapter 90 funds, which we received at $842,339. If you recall from last week's meeting, uh, Mr. Mooring in the presentation from DPW said we need about $2 million every year to try to dig in a little bit into our um, road maintenance problem. There are a lot of um, potholes out there. Uh, we have three crews. Oh, I hadn't noticed. You hadn't <laughs> noticed. <laughs> um, it's been a really rough winter. Um, some people say not much different than previous winters. I'm not sure. I haven't been here long enough. I'll leave it to other, other people's judgments. Um, we have, um, but they explained, I think, pretty, in pretty good detail. There are three crews on the streets. I mean, today there are three crews out filling potholes wherever they can. There's just a lot of roads in, in this town that we're trying to address. Um, talked about ambulance. Uh, Beacon Communities continues to work towards gaining its permits uh, so they can begin construction in the spring. They're very organized and I think they've gone through almost everything they need to do on this uh, at, with uh, building commissioner. So they will be having a groundbreaking relatively soon. Um, the Musanti Center again is moving forward. They're, they're preparing to give um, some, uh, pat, some uh, tours to people and I think you may get an invitation to one pretty soon if you haven't already uh, to one. Okay. Did you have a date or some It's later in March. Yeah, I don't have the date. It's March, yeah. April. Yeah. Um, the cultural district signs, there are 
for cultural district science, there's, for two of them that are attached to buildings, they're still going through the permitting process. Um, they do have the permit for one on um, Main Street, um, the, where the Amherst Media owns the property. So they're going to. We will be installing a sign there, and the one on Realignment Park. We've already approved that one, and they've gotten their permits for that. Um, let's see. Um, the North Amherst Library, I think I reported last time that there were um, five proposals. They interviewed three, and then the committee ranked them. And so I'm, um, Kuhn Riddle was rated as the top um, su submission there. So I will be negotiating with them on the top rated, uh, as the top rated candidate for, for a price. If we don't agree on a price on that, then we go to the second rated um, um, en entity. Um, the Health Insurance Trust. This week we have a meeting with the Insurance Advisory Committee. Um, last time the Insurance Advisory Committee met, uh, which was school vacation week, so it must have been like February 20th or something like that, um, there was, the committee did not make a recommendation, so we um, have the, um, this week as a follow-up meeting. Um, it's a critical meeting because we need direction uh, from the committee um, and we hope that they'll see the wisdom of moving forward in this sort of direction that I think that I've outlined before, which is to consolidate our risk pool by eliminating one of the carriers, um, by um, by moving to a fully insured program so the risk is migrating from the, um, the town to an insurance company and to do plan design changes. Um, failure to m make these changes means that we will have significant increases in our self-insurance plan starting July 1, um, which is just not sustainable. It's, not, it's hard on employees, but it's really not sustainable to the town and to the school district. And um, we hope to communicate that to our insurance advisory committee. From the union's point of view, it's hard to come back and recommend changes to the health plan. Um, but I think we've done a fair amount of education. A lot of employees come up to me and say, I understand the need. Uh, we've had no increases for a number of years. We've benefited from that. We get it. Um, we're hoping that the union leadership moves forward on this. And if so, then you will see our implementation plan. We will begin a really aggressive um, plan to educate employees and have them re-enroll. We will have um, Blue Cross and Maya would have people at every uh, work site, every, um, every at school site, uh, at the DPW, at the at the fire stations, um, at the police, everywhere we, our employees gather, and they'll be multiple times, multiple times a day, um, really reach out to it. Because health insurance is a really personal thing, so when you, you can have a joint meeting and talk to people, where people can read about things, but they really want to know, how does this affect me, my child has this need, um, tell me what's covered, what's not covered. It's a, it's a big change, but it's something that's important. If we don't, um, aren't able to reach an agreement this way, then there is a, a, a portion of the law that allows um, the employer uh, to adopt sections, what they call sections 21 to 23, which um, sets forth a, a clock that starts ticking that allows for a negotiating process um, to go, th not, it's not even negotiating, it's sort of, sort of conversation that happens with the collective bargaining units um, that section of the law would have to be appro uh, approved by the select board, by the, by the select board in Pelham, and by the Amherst Re Regional School District uh, School Committee. Um, it's not a path we want to go down. Um, if we have to, we have to. Um, but it's a, um, it's, it's a law that was put into place by the state uh, to sort of break log jams like this if it need be. Um, I'm hoping we don't have to come back because I would have to give you more education on it, obviously, so you know what you're doing. But, um, if that were the case, that would be something we'd do later this month or early in April. Um, so that's pretty much the things I had to report to you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there questions or comments or? For the manager, relative to this report or other topics, Ms. Brewer. 
So um, just a couple of follow-ups. Thank you so much for giving us this extensive report and writing. And I also appreciate you not reading all of it to us. <laughs> um, a couple of things to follow up on. One is on page three, mm -hmm. under major capital projects, yep. under the North Ant Common restoration. Um, I'm not mean, I am going to tease you, I guess, about exactly what this wording means. So there are few parking spaces lost. So if we weren't talking about the plaza type space, we were only going with what we already knew about the North Common, were we going to lose any of the parking spaces? Yes, we would lose a certain number of parking spaces because the parking spaces are too narrow right now. They would not meet uh, current, current standards. Okay. So there will be a certain number lost. I don't know the number. Anyway. Anyway, even if we said let's replace like All for like. All we're doing is like for yep. like. Okay. And then they are also being sensitive to, as you referred to earlier, not many more than that, hopefully, <laughs> because of it being such a prime location in town. Right. And I'm thinking, I'm talking to Mr. Zomak, it's unlikely that we will, I was pushing very hard to try to get the construction done this summer, but I don't think that's likely because it will be a very involved process with lots of committees and I think public participation is going to be very important. It's the most important piece of land in town for us. So I think the public participation will be happening this spring and summer, but not sure how far we'll get along this line to get it done this spring, this year, I mean. Which segues nicely into the other part of my follow-up question, which is that, um, and this holds true for Groff Park as well, but focus mainly on the North Common restoration since we've been talking, well, we've been talking about both of them for a long time, but North Common, we had some different outreach meetings. We had some walk-arounds out there over the years as we continued to apply for grants and kept showing that we were doing public participation. There's already been some um, concern expressed by some of the committees involved that will eventually, which I appreciate you listing out um, which ones they are, about when they're going to see what. And I think one of the things that would be super helpful that we've not consistently done in the past is to you know have staff brainstorm some way of coming up with a list of you know for example here's an here's a, an outreach meeting let's get somebody from each of those committees to that meeting along with the public and then let's put out a schedule of it's going to be before leisure services commission this state it's going to be before historical commission this state because i think it's a mistake to assume that one anybody can possibly keep track of all those different meetings and all their different choices of when to pipe up and two you probably don't want to wait and i know there's already been some outreach done um, you don't want to wait until it's time to get the approval to go to that committee mm -hmm. you want to have set the stage with them prior to that. And I know this is a huge amount of work for staff to go to all these different places in addition to all the other things they're already doing. But we get so much visibility associated with this and so many fussing if we don't do it in what people perceive as the most effective way. So maybe just think about how to do things slightly differently this time out to make it super clear we're trying to get people together to do this because we're going to have to go to these other boards and you're welcome to come to those and those are whatever they are officially to get the approvals done but to get some more people on board before that mm -hmm. i think would be super helpful i think a good model was the downtown recreation working group <clears throat> that was a, a mr zomek hosted a major meeting 50 people in the room i think with all the com all the committees and boards <laughs> present um to sort of hear from the consultant about what they are, were seeing um, I think the same kind of model will probably be followed. Right now, there's nothing really, we know what we want, but there are no plans or anything. It's we want to really be good listeners at the beginning of this process. Since Ms. Brewer mentioned fussing, I thought I'd fuss a bit. <laughs> and at least as a courtesy to list the Downtown Parking Working Group as part of mm -hmm. some touch point around parking. This is a major parking lot here. I'm not saying they're going to point, yeah. be the deciders, but please don't leave them out. Good point. Other questions for the manager? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So appreciate that. Our guests have arrived. Yes, Ms. Before we start with our guests, can we take a brief recess? Absolutely. Let's take about a oh, that, four or five oh, minutes. That. <laughs> uh, recess to let us uh, stretch, stretch our, our legs. legs. So you can get your PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if I can stand. 
just going to use that. We'll roll you into the elevator later and down and roll right out to your car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a friend of mine has a, actually with his phone, it, it buzzes like every 10 minutes, so he stands up just because that's what you're supposed to do that. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, I have a standing desk at work. Do you? Yeah. I don't stand quite as much as I did when I... I actually made one originally. I bought some shelving that actually for me would mm -hmm. be about right. Mm -hmm. This is an advantage of being the height I am. Yeah. Um, but we subsequently got a desk that goes... Yeah. The thing I found with making my own stand-up desk, <coughs> you do need to stand up, but it's hard to stand the entire day. Yeah. Um, but I've got a desk now that raises and lowers. Yeah. So that's really that's helpful. Nice. We've really so a couple, couple people got those. Yeah. A little early. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody gets uh, not not a homemade one. Yeah, right. They get one of these nice ones, and they're misses one. They say like, "Will you really use it or not?" Right now. Right. 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 But do, so, do you get tired standing up the whole time? No, not too bad. Well, I'll 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 set it. I'll lower it and sit down for an hour or two, and mm -hmm. switch back. And yeah. I go, you know, kind of up and down a couple of times throughout the course of the day. It's really, it's for me, it's very nice because I don't <coughs> so to stand. Nice a lot of times. And, uh, having gone to originally, you know, even with my homemade little thing that I did, helped a lot as yeah. far as just comfort by the end of the day. Yes, yeah. it's just always get an opportunity to get it, move around. Says our meeting's only until 9:30. I know. <laughs> We're gonna make our way through it. I, was, I don't know who room decided room. that for us, but Mary, maybe. Yeah, really. <laughs> Wishful thinking. <laughs> Damn person. <laughs> all right. So we're all back. That's good. So we'll uh, jump back into our agenda where we uh, sort of skipped the, skipped away from a section just because we knew we had folks coming and, right. and that they weren't going to be available until now. Excuse me. So next on our agenda is 4E, which is potential time in the article, the use of E Street School for affordable housing. Um, do you want to paint the picture? It's got your name next to it. We'll let you uh, uh, sure. give, us a, give us a go at the beginning of this. Uh, so as you know, um, the E Street School has been utilized but not actively utilized uh, for quite for a couple years now. And the, uh, the trust um, has express, expressed interest in uh, <coughs> being able to have the permission to start to explore that East Street School site, which includes the building plus the field, the little field that's adjacent to it, uh, for affordable housing purposes. And we have Mr. Harnick from the trust here who'd like to speak about that. Just as a reminder, while you get settled, just please make sure to mention who you are and that for the, for the folks at home watching. And John Hornick, chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, a resident of Amherst, a member of town meeting, and someone who's just delighted to be here this evening. <laughs> I'm delighted to have you. Um, I think uh, the town manager just summarized what the property is about as well as what our interest is. Um, we do hope if the property is developable, to be able to facilitate the building of likely 
family housing units on that property. Um, the main obstacles at the moment are uh, the fact that the property is pretty wet, an indication possibly that there may be some barriers, one of which would be running into wetlands regulations that would make it unbuildable. The other is a significant amount of ground groundwater that, oops, that could also create difficulties for building. So um, immediately, we are planning to get an appropriate engineer over to the property as soon as it's dry for uh, four or five days and to look at those two issues. If the property passes, then the next step would be to engage additional engineers and architects to talk about both what we could do with the existing E Street School building. Is that something that we could use effectively as part of this project? And second, beyond that, to look at uh, what else we could build on that property again, given any constraints we learn about related to wetlands or groundwater. Um, <clears throat> this, this is the beginning of really what is a long process. If it all works out, I guess at best we might see uh, people moving in in two to three years. Uh, so it's not something that happens overnight. On the other hand, the trust needs to be in a position to be free to move forward with the understanding from the town that indeed if we overcome all these hurdles to housing and we're able to uh, put out a request for proposals for development of the land, including what the town would support in the way of resources for a developer, that then the project will go forward. If we don't have that assurance, then it's pretty hard for us to move forward uh, expeditiously and to be able really to work with potential developers on this project. So what we are proposing is that there be a warrant article before town meeting that would, in effect, deed the land to the housing trust, not immediately, but at such point as we have developed uh, demonstrated that the property is developer and ideally that we have a developer in hand having gone through the RFP process. You might ask, well, why don't you want to take it over immediately? Well, again, with all these obstacles, there is no point in the trust taking over the property from the town if it turns out that at some point we're going to say, no, we can't move forward and just have to turn the property back to the town. So our goal here is to, again, get a warrant article that gives us a clear path forward, but that ends at a point at which, uh, that is where the property is turned over to us, where indeed uh, we have a developer in hand and can move forward. And uh, actually, town council has at least begun drafting such a warrant article, uh, thanks to the assistance of uh, Dave Zomek and Nate Malloy. And so I think by town meeting, we should be prepared to move forward with this. You will obviously see a, a draft of the warrant article before it goes to town meeting um, at an appropriate time, I assume in the pretty near future. So that's briefly my story, um, and uh, I'm willing to entertain questions or to refer questions to our expert consultant, Rita Farrell, who's also here this evening. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Hornick to begin with? I was thinking someone had the look of having some questions. <laughs> <coughs> Anybody need coffee? <laughs> no. So, so I'm this brewer writing things down, so I figured she had So I'm going to ask actually a very simple question because I'm looking at the map a little bit and, and, and I've not actually walked the property and I've been to the site uh, a while ago but not recently and not onto the back 
playing fields area, but I was looking at how narrowly it's contiguous, but one would say just barely. Um, you know, at that narrowest point, sort of what's that span of, of space? We're looking at a map here, this, this space in here. I'm just sort of curious as to, does anyone know roughly? It looks like about 15 feet. And if, if you do answer, you should come up to the mic so they can hear you on, on TV. And you certainly, we can put two chairs there, so don't hesitate. I'm just, it's just to get a frame of reference about that. You know, it's like sometimes that could be 300 feet, and sometimes I don't think so, given what I know of the property. It looks more like 15 or so, but if you would. Sure. I, um, my name is Rita Farrell, and I am um, serving as a consultant to the Amherst Municipal Trust. So um, I sort of jumped the gun there because I thought you were asking um, what the land area was in that back playing field, which is about 1.8 acres. But you are correct. And then 0.5 is the front part where the, the building and then some of the land that you know immediately um, uh, faces East Street. So the distance between the, so you're talking about the, um, the kind of access area to the back of that site. I would guess it's about 25 feet, maybe at the most. It's, it's not, it's not a, a wide area and certainly would be a challenge in terms of site design and access to that back parcel. Right, okay, I'm just curious about that. My question is just, I, I wanna be clear. Um, what we're looking at is, um, a Warren article that would come from the select board that's in process of being written that we would review probably under the same kind of timeline we talked about earlier. Um, and then it would become a, um, a select board article, but with the understanding that the trust would be essentially explaining this, or I'm just trying to understand what we're being asked for tonight because we don't have any language. So to follow up on that, that certainly is one of the questions, but because I would have assumed, just based on our brief conversation at agenda setting, that it's not a select board article, it's a trust oh, article. Okay. And um, of course, we'll oh, be yeah. asked eventually to take a position on it. And, um, but I mean, it oh, is unusual that we're hearing about it ahead committee. of time. It. It's not it. right, and that's why it didn't fall okay. under that set of deadlines, okay, because, um, so good, so that is true. And one of the things that, that I expressed to Mr. Zomek at that point too, and that I'm sure is going to be addressed, but it's really kind of hard to get our arms around at this point when we haven't seen the draft, and we're not gonna have a lot of time to see the draft. And so we'll see the draft warrant one day, and then two weeks later, we will go ahead and vote that that's the warrant article. And depending on how much time we have at our meeting on the 19th, whether or not we can try and pull that apart and understand what it actually means because it's an unusual warrant article. And so I'm not sure that it will be, um, sometimes these things are rather technically written in terms of our understanding. My biggest concern is that because we made a very specific point when we set up the trust to give the trust basically every power we possibly could under Mass General Law rather than making it tighter, which some people at some point thought we should, but we instead listed out all the things basically that a trust could possibly do. What I'm trying to avoid is the criticism at some point in front of town meeting that there would be the possibility that the trust would have control of this property and then decide to sell it. That's what I'm trying to avoid. And so how how can that be addressed in this hypothetical Warren article I haven't seen because I don't that I just don't understand what the mechanisms are to prevent that from happening given that the trust does have that power right. to sell property, um, which could be entirely appropriate in another scenario but would not be appropriate in this scenario as I as I would understand it. Right, so I think the first thing I'll do is, and maybe Mr. Zomek can answer better than you can, but I was just sort of curious is do we have a sense of where the draft language is for the, for the Warren article? I mean, my initial sense of it would be that the Warren article would constrain them for under certain purposes, which would help constrain how in which the, the trust could dispose of the property, but, but perhaps Mr. Zomek can paint that picture a little bit more if you've had conversations with our council. Yes, thank you very much. So, um, the as I understood it, the, the select board did not want to 
see the draft language tonight. This was an informal discussion, giving you an overall sense of uh, the, the request from the trust. Um, Shreen Everett from Copeland and Page has drafted um, some language already that we're reviewing staff and talking with, uh, with John and Rita about um, in, in the days ahead. If uh, you decide tonight that this is something that you want to at least move forward with to that stage. In terms of, uh, again, we've had some preliminary conversations with, with Sharon Everett. Um, she then went away for a couple of weeks. She's back today for the first time in, in a few weeks, so we'll reconnect with her. My understanding is that uh, town council will recommend that um, the warrant article will not include everything. It'll be rather narrowly focused and then that there will be some other additional agreement with the trust, between the trust and the town, um, that will call out some of the specifics, but it certainly will address Ms. Brewer's question about uh, resale. And that is not something that, my understanding is that is not something that the trust is interested in. This really gives them the opportunity to do their due diligence, do, do the due diligence with the confidence that if that uh, plays out in a positive scenario that the town is willing to then move forward. And it gives them that confidence to discuss opportunities with other developers, other partners, um, but it gives them that, that confidence. I'll just add to what Mr. Zomek said. My expectation is that the warrant article will say that the transfer is for the sole purpose of developing affordable housing. It will not allow, for example, the circumstance that Ms. Brewer uh, pointed to in which the trust can sell the property uh, without, uh, any, for any purpose. Mr. Steinberg? Uh, the most common uh, form of the, these resolutions, as I recall these um, at town meeting, is actually an authorization to the select board to act. Is that is your understanding? Uh, so um, the question is, does that get put in at what um, at the select board level or does it get put in at the um, level of town meeting or action itself? And there, there are arguments for doing both. I'm not pushing for one or the other. But uh, I think that it's important to remember that there are two separate actions that have to take place in sequence. Again, I believe <clears throat> that is what Ms. Everett recommended, exactly what you proposed, Andy. Questions? Comments? I wonder if the select board wants to see the language sooner rather than later. Obviously, Ms. Everett's just back in the office and she needs to get the feedback from staff that that they need to give her. But what I'm trying to avoid is a problem later on. And so, uh, which is why I think they've made the effort to come out and see us tonight. And so, um, if we could at least have that language distributed to us, and then we could get back to Mr. Bachman with questions or whoever he wants us to get back to with questions about the language to see if it looks just like everything Mr. Steinberg has referenced in terms of historic stuff or if something jumps out at it about us so that potentially we could have those issues addressed before it comes back to us on March 19th right. as part of the draft warrant. I right. think that would be helpful. So I guess my other question is, have you um, developed a work plan for the project that would set up a sequence of what happens that would um, sort of project when it is likely that the conveyance would actually have to finally happen at that last step and what it depends on? Uh, I don't think we have a per chart. We've talked about step by step what we need to do but we haven't put a timeline on it except to say that as soon as practical, we do want an analysis of the wetlands and the groundwater issue. Hopefully that would be late March, uh, early April. And so that's a clear significant decision point. If we pass that, 
then, as I said, the next uh, analysis would have to do with architects coming in and engineers looking at the existing structure and looking at the property and coming back with some ideas about what we could do with it. Uh, I, I don't know, Rita may be able to speak better to what the timeline is for that, but at this point we don't have a timeline. Um, my guesstimate is that it could be done within four to five months from now. You know, if the, if the wetlands delineation can get done at the end of March and then um, uh, we're not looking at an intensive uh, architectural design, but some schematic designs based on the wetlands to see um, how many units could be put on the site, if units can be put on the site. Um, and then uh, the, the, probably the largest question is, is what's done with the building itself, because it presents um, some real challenges in terms of uh, the cost of doing any kind of conversion. I think for those of you who are around, um, when, it was, when it was looked at for the LSSE offices, you know, it's a very, that, that building, just getting the handicapped accessibility and, and dealing with some of the, um, the, the, the capital needs, the heating, plumbing, electrical, all of that uh, within the building um, is quite expensive, and it's not a lot of floor area. So um, you're dealing with some very significant costs to, to get the handicapped accessibility and then to, to do any kind of conversion. So that's, you know, that's a, a big nut to crack, and I think um, we, we, we get the wetlands done, if that looks like there's some possibility, then you get to a schematic, looking at the property, and then testing financial feasibility. So saying, given everything that we know about number of units that the, that the site could um, absorb and the cost of doing the, this, converting the school building, you know, to what's the sources and uses? You know, how do we, how do we make it work? Is it a combination of um, some market rate housing plus some affordable housing? Is it all affordable? Um, that we won't know until we take, you know, really understand the, um, what we're dealing with in terms of the, the building and the number of units, because that has a lot of bearing on how the numbers could work. Yeah. It's, a, it's a complex puzzle because there's also two other questions. One is financing, and uh, I mean, we've all been observing what has happened with the Beacon um, in North Amherst and the sequence that it took to get to where it finally thankfully is um, but it was uh, but that's um, out there and so is there is the conveyance necessary before the financing is lined up and you don't have to answer that right now but eventually that we do need to know that um, the other thing that we need to bear in mind um, is making sure that regardless of what the voters do um, with the charter vote on March 27, that we have a mechanism that um, works for both scenarios because um, if we want this to happen, then we want to make sure that we have that covered. Um, well, a, a couple things, and um, actually, what Ms. Farrell just said triggered uh, one thought when we talked about restricting it for housing use only. It could be that the building, the existing building, is usable, but it might involve non housing use, uses in a housing development in the context of, how, like, say, offices for social services. One of the ideas people have talked about just when you look at the feasibility, both structurally and financially. So I think to be careful to not say it all has to be just housing, but in auxiliary to that or in support of if there's some historic preservation that can happen there but it might be a different use complementary to housing so just to make sure there's an out there um miss brewer said do we want to see the language sooner i don't really care i think in concept um i'm really um looking forward to some the 
staff and the trust members and um, our council working on something that will allow this to go forward. I, I believe that the trust um, should have a project like this to work on. This site, this building has been talked about um, well for a long time, but more um, specifically in the last few years by the trust as a trust project and for all kinds of good reasons it's just taken this long to get to this point and I would really like to see us move this to the next level and um, I think in terms of the timing of the conveyance there's a certain point where you will you need to assure prospective developers or respondents to an RFP that this is free and clear and ready to go if it, a proposal is accepted so that Timing has to get kind of finessed around that. Um, and I'm sure there's better minds here who can figure that out. But um, I think at some point the, the work plan or the projected timeline, we may want to see that. But a, a lot of that's, you know, I, I'm less concerned about the language because I think we have people who are more expert on putting that together. We might find a little glitch we often do or whatever, but I think we have time to do that kind of correction okay. at our meeting on the 19th. I wouldn't be opposed to seeing it earlier myself, but partly because I sit on the yeah. trust and so I'm sort of, <laughs> you, you I want to advocate it. for it properly if necessary. Um, but I, uh, you know, it will have to be out of the context of a meeting, so we can't discuss amongst ourselves. So it would be, mm -hmm. so if you get it early, then see something. sort of set, let it set if yeah. you don't want to. I think the other thing I'll, I'll just uh, add on to a little bit that you've mentioned, and it, it, it touches on a point that, that uh, uh, Mr. Steinberg made about financing, one of the ways in which you can, you know, if you look to partner with organizations that are, that are really in the process of doing development, because the trust is not very likely to do the full-scale development from, from ground zero kind of thing. Um, so you're going to look to partner with people, and, and they want some assurances that you have a level of control of the property, in, in, partly so that they just don't do a bunch of work and spend a, uh, their own money uh, with no possibility of getting any recoupment of that, but also just uh, as they align their, fi their financing uh, for any project they might have, that, that level of site control you know, makes the banks and whoever else is involved in financing be able to have some some confidence in that as well. So I think that we will visit that topic quite a bit um, as, as things move along. Um, did others have questions or comments for Ms. Brewer? So I, I'm sorry if this was already addressed, but um, given that, I, because I am certainly not a professional in this area, I think we're going to have to tear it down because we could have used it for leisure services offices and we didn't. I mean, it's not, if it was good for office space, we would have used it for those offices in addition to programming. is isn't to say brand new amazing things don't get developed every day, and so maybe there is a way. <laughs> but um, given that, if it does need to be torn down, uh, is it subject to demolition delay? And so... I think it's an old enough it's building, It's the yeah. usual, well, I mean, obviously it's old <laughs> enough, but there's no reason why it, it's not exempted for any reason. So that, that would be that would still be an issue. So people don't need to panic that it's coming down anytime soon is part of right. what I'm trying to get across here. And the reason for the earliness of the language is just to ensure that people don't say later, I wish it had said this other thing. So that's all I'm concerned about. So if people want, if it's possible to get it out a few days, given that we don't have a meeting next week, mm -hmm. right. if it's possible to get it out to the select board and then just say feedback to the town manager. And if you don't, care to look at it in more detail, then don't complain on the 19th. <laughs> we wouldn't dare. Mr. Buckman. So, but I think that's an important point. If the select board feels like we will transfer the property, but we don't want the building torn down, if that's a value that you're going to say we want to put on that warrant article or whatever, or if you care, if you don't care if it gets torn down or not, you might be in a position where you might have to pre-think that um, idea during the, during the warrant article or something. That will certainly come up. Um, I would think at the at town meeting, if nowhere else. Mr. Horning. Um, two things. One, I expect the warrant article will be mute on the issue of what the future of the building will be. The second thing I want to say, which uh, goes in part to responding to Mr. Steinberg's question earlier about the timeline, one of the members of the trust is Tom Kegelman, um, who in his day job does development in the city of Springfield and elsewhere in the valley. <coughs> and one of the things Tom has talked about is one of our goals should be 
to put together a request for proposals that not only describes the site and what we like to see, but also offers a package of what the town is willing to support, which obviously in this case would include the property. It might include CPA funds. We have requested that CPA move a certain amount of money into the trust, and if we have control over it at that point, that is one of the things we can offer. So I think my point is, is um, we're not only thinking about the property, but also trying to structure a process and a request for proposals that will be as welcoming to an appropriate developer <coughs> as it possibly can be. Other questions? I just want to, as a follow-up to something that Mr. Bachman said, um, it's not for me a question of whether I have an opinion one way or another on uh, the nature, historic nature of that building, but it's actually a decision of the Historic Commission as to whether it feels that it's historically significant and therefore wants to uh, impose a one-year delay, as happens periodically, including the Little Red Schoolhouse at Amherst College, I believe. Um, and I think that's the, um, you know, just factoring that into the timeline thinking. Absolutely. Ms. Brewer. Maybe I'd be better off to <coughs> Mr. Bachman speak for himself on that because I think <laughs> he was saying something else so my, that you're not. Yeah, so my, my there are cross purposes. Yeah, I think I think the delay is one thing, but if the if you if the board or the town feels that's an important building from the town's historic, uh, and we don't want it torn down, you control that at this moment in time, and you cannot let it be torn down, if you don't want it to. But if you say we don't, we'll leave that up to the decision of the development team. That's a different decision. Just to follow up, uh, that sort of gets into the policy we just adopted a few hours ago, and uh, because this is essentially we're doing this because we're viewing this as surplus property, and uh, the uh, not tearing it down really is only an appropriate thing to do if we have a feasible alternative use for it. Ms. Kruger. Um, I, I, I agree, but um, regardless of how I might feel about <coughs> that building and its significance, the desirability of keeping it or the practicality and maybe not keeping it, I think it might be good to have a kind of a courtesy visit to the Historical Commission just talking about how this might play out and how the decision making might go because I can see we're going to get to town meeting and if they feel like they haven't been part of the conversation at all, um, you know, like any place, rumors start and questions come up and I think that kind of just, you know, look, we would like to use it but we don't know if it's, it's empty forever, that's not actually saving it. Da, 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 da. But I think the worst thing is if they feel like they're out of the picture and all of a sudden they read about it in the paper. And so, Ms. Brewer. I think that's a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, it, referencing back, and, and uh, I'm going <coughs> to argue with Mr. Steinberg a little bit, and is that oh, while it might <laughs> seem completely obvious to you that we would leave it up to the Historical <coughs> Commission to make that decision, what I was trying to reflect back on was that as Mr. Bachelman pointed out, it's within our control right now. If we do this warrant article, it will not be. Now the select board's position might very well rationally be that we're not those people, that's the historic commission's job, or it could be that because in a different planet with a different set of select board members, this particular building does hold a particular value for the community that we say that no matter what the Historical Commission thinks, we think this. It sounds like we quite possibly don't believe that. We quite possibly agree with Mr. Steinberg, but this is our chance to figure that out, is what I'm getting at, even though, practically speaking, that may seem like the most obvious thing to do. That would not necessarily be the most obvious thing to do if a different select board was sitting here. 
because this is a moment at which we have control before it ever gets to the point of the stroke commission. And I was kind of waiting, timing-wise, for someone to bring up the surplus property. So you win, Mr. Steinberg, um, because we talked about that at agenda setting as to how to accommodate this particular test case, given that we were just now putting the surplus property into play. And I think that um, it's, it became obvious that we move along with this particular project because this particular project has its own trajectory and while we can apply elements of the surplus property description to remind us of things that we're doing associated with that it is in a, as though we have already determined that it is surplus property in this particular case or we could have taken a different tack tonight if this conversation was going a different way and say mm, wait stop we just did this awesome policy and we need to make sure it goes through this policy. So that is another option that is available to us. It's not one I would recommend, but it is one that we we needed to have this conversation tonight to make sure that it wasn't suddenly important to people that we put it through a policy that we've waited this long to have um, and knowing what we know about the history of this property and how it has been being looked at for housing. That is not like just a an idea that came up the day after we took surplus property action. So we we have some choices now that we won't have later. We can't decide later to put it through the whole surplus property discussion. We can't decide later that we're willing to let the historic commission decide, but we won't have a decision. And so I'm I'm not arguing that we can't that we need to stop anything. I'm just saying there's some decision points that we have available to us now that won't be available later. Couple sure. quick things. Um, I think we want the historical commission to have a consultative, consulting role. You know, we want to consult with them in some ways. I would be willing to, and it may be wise to, have the language, if possible, reflect um, that the feasibility or the um, practicality of preserving. Um, that building will indeed be looked at, but to um, not have the, the actual decision rest with someone else. I mean, I think that decision, we can authorize the decision to be made based on some some set of something feasible, but to say it'll, it'll definitely be considered and looked at, but if all things point to it not being able to be kept, um, that that ultimately would be okay, but sort of assuring people that it'll it'll be looked at. And I don't know if there's a way to kind of build it, build something in that talks about that without an absolute requirement that it be saved. Um, but to, I would want the historical commission to feel like we've heard them and consulted with them as well. Any thoughts about? Uh, yeah. Does that, Ms. Brewer? Does that address? any of what you were talking about? I understand the words you are saying. <laughs> I don't know how they translate into action for town meeting. Right. So I think that it's valuable input for the petitioners to consider, mm -hmm. to just right, strongly consider going to talk to Historic Commission purely so that they're in the loop now because they would be in the loop differently were we going through the actual surplus property disposition process. So I guess the, the point on this is if you, it depends who controls the property. And if there, so if the trust controls the property and, and if you say we want a restriction on it that says you must keep this building for whatever reason, suppose you, you just like the building, then they put out an RFP that says develop the property but you have to keep this building. If you say we don't care if the building's up or not, then, we, then they do their best judgment on what is the best use of that piece, that piece of land. So it's just really a matter of who controls the building from your perspective. Um, and you're, what this Warren article is saying, I believe, I haven't seen it, but is to say the trust will control the building. And that's the pivotal question for town meeting as to who will take control the building, this, this piece of land. Actually, no, I don't think that's precisely correct. <laughs> as I understand it, the article will mean that the town remains in control up to the point at which we have a developer in hand who is ready to go forward. So until we reach that point, the town is re retains control of the property. That's, again, what I suggested earlier, that we wanted to avoid a situation 
where the trust formally owns the property, and then because one or another difficulty comes up, we say, okay, we can't go forward. We have to turn it back to the town with whatever legal costs and the like need to be absorbed as a consequence of that return. So we're trying to avoid that, which means that the town will have control. Um, I mean, in the document, or the I should say the memo that Ms. Farrell and I co-drafted that you received, it does say that we will do an analysis of the feasibility of retaining that building. Um, and I would share the memo that we shared with you with the uh, Historic Commission. I personally commit to doing that. So that will initiate the conversation that you're asking. Um, on the other hand, we have been advised to keep the language of the warrant article as simple as possible, so I'm reluctant to put that into the warrant article. On the other hand, Mr. <coughs> Zomek referenced a, a kind of an outside agreement that we could have with the select board that would probably include that language. Uh, in my initial conversations with Sharon Everett at Coleman and Page, that is exactly what she recommended is to keep the article fairly short, tight, and then move items like uh, a review and practical analysis of the building to a, an agreement between the trust and the select board. So yeah. I think that's fairly common practice and um, she has drafted even points in that that would go in that document. Um, and so. Thank you. So the warrant article will connect those things, though. I mean, the warrant article obviously won't list the points to go in the future agreement. But what I'm trying to say is that, so town meeting, right, town meeting's going to see some, we don't have this thing in front of us, town meeting is going to see something that then, in addition to various verbal assurances, also says something in the article itself about, and there will be an agreement. My understanding is that it would authorize the select board to enter into negotiations and an agreement with the trust. And we could speak to what trust. elements would be in that. It would not be drafted at that point because we don't want to presuppose, but we may have some talking points or, or things we know will be in there. And I suspect that a, 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 an analysis of the financial feasibility and, and uh, how practical it would be to reuse the, the existing East Street School would be in that agreement. Are there further questions or comments? Well, thank you both very much for coming, and we appreciate your uh, your input and your in your uh, presenting this to us, so that we're you know sort of up to speed as it were uh, as we move ahead. And I know that you know, from being on the trust, but also preceding my time on the trust, that, that this is an area, physically an area, that uh, has been of interest for a long time. So I think it's an opportunity for the the trust to take some action, even if it's decide no, we can't do anything there. Uh, to clarify that for folks and that, you know, uh, you know, allows us to move ahead. I was just going to follow up since I talked so much already. I thought I would go ahead and clarify, not that the newspaper is still here, but for anyone listening at home who might have sorted out that I said that we've in effect declared this property surplus. While that is true in one hand, it is not actually true according to the way the policy is written, and it's not actually true legally. That's and correct. so um, it, it's a side process that's not really fitting in here. We're aware of this. We're thinking about the different elements that are in here. But for all the reasons we've already stated, we are not you know, skipping to step six and going right. ahead and declaring the property surplus. We are working on a very specific project with a very specific group for a very specific purpose. And if that purpose doesn't work out, it never actually gets transferred to them. And then once it gets tra transferred to them, if some other things go wrong, there's still some other things to be looked at. Right. <coughs> Again, thank you both very much for coming. Thank you, Mr. Zomek, for being here as well. Appreciate you sharing with us. So I'm going to take off. All right, Mr. Steinberg, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steinberg. So the last thing we have, I believe, remaining are select board member reports. Um, and I believe all the other things have taken care I assume Mr. Steinberg doesn't have anything, so I was going <laughs> He's the one who put 930 on the sign. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to 
turn to either of my colleagues and see if they have some select work. I have a couple of things, but they can keep for a moment. So if either of you have some things you'd like to mention. So you can talk about the Hampshire County Youth Legislative Forum we went to together, Mr. Slaughter, and the Mass Municipal Association uh, had kicked off their series of legislative breakfast meetings in Palmer. I'm glad we didn't drag Mr. Steinberg to that when um, he wasn't up to a car trip for that purpose. And what I will say for that event is we got to make a remark associated with affordable housing and zoning in terms of MMA's priorities. And we also got to make another remark associated with MMA's priorities around local licensing for marijuana, which I don't believe they still are elaborating on to the detail I would like them to. Um, and I expressed that to David Lakeman and he was very receptive as, he, as they were um, on the more complex issue of affordable housing and zoning, which I'm sure Ms. Kruger could get into in great detail. But the other thing that I wanted to mention associated with it is that the reason you go to those meetings is to make sure there isn't something new you don't know about. <laughs> and there wasn't. And the other thing that made it <laughs> weird is that we were in Palmer, which is not here. And um, even though it's only 35 minutes away and it can take a while to get to Leverett sometimes too in Belchertown, um, different representatives, so Senator Gobi was there and Representative Smola, who we don't normally see at anything. And um, they also had magically, despite the fact that we walked in right at the end of Coffee and Conversation and right at the beginning of Welcome by Host Community, which is when they then normally get the long report from MMA and then you ask the legislators questions and uh, yeah, that didn't happen. They were already talking and wrapping up when we were walking in because they had something else to be at. Surprise, we didn't know that, um, driving to Palmer and it was a very small crowd, so it was not the best uh, use of everyone's time when it comes right down to it, but I did appreciate that MMA sent people out and they did talk to us, and so um, I found that it was probably better to know um, that there wasn't anything new and to get our two comments in in another, in another fashion. Thank you. Ms. Green? Just on that, was it Representative Gopi? So Gobi? that's Senator Gobi and so Senator and Gobi, and he said, "What other Smola. issues would you like us to be aware of in, in your community?" And I said, "Sanctuary community and gun control." And then later, I found out that he was a Republican because I didn't know who he was, and I was like, "Oh, that probably went over really well." And he was like, <laughs> well, we don't have he one opinion; it. <laughs> we have different opinions on where that's going to go in terms of the sanctuary. So, no, he was cordial. He, he got out quite of there, cordial. so um, I, I, he was like, well, what are issues in your community that the legislature might want to know about? And so I did, did that. Um, that was just my, that was my add-on. And also Representative um, Goldstein Rose was yes, there. That's true. That is true. He did come as well. And they all had to leave early. Yes, they had to go do a thing. Right. So I have a few things. Um, first off, uh, we did go to the... If you would be so kind as to show me the brochure again, Hampshire <laughs> County Youth Legislative Forum, which was uh, uh, an event put on by AmeriCorps, I believe, is uh, most of who was there. However, it did have uh, uh, Representative um, Goldstein Rose, it had uh, Senator Rosenberg was there, the Assistant Superintendent uh, Doreen Cunningham from the schools was there, I was there, Ms. Brewer was there, uh, a staffer for a Senator number. Adam Hines. Thank you. John Gould. Yep. Yes was there um, and so we had this uh, I was uh, mistakenly thinking it was going to be mostly sort of you know Amherst kids and a few others from maybe like Belcher Town and Hadley and Northampton or something but it was actually kids from kind of throughout the Piner Valley and they they brought to uh, our attention a few a few issues that were were interesting to hear about um, some of them were sort of curious about sort of what we did and how we did what we did and so it was it was uh, it was an interesting uh, you know couple hours uh, on Friday afternoon right mm -hmm. and so what was interesting was also just talking about senators and representatives dashing off to things I guess Friday was the day that they all went to about a bunch of uh, half a dozen different things because mr. Uh, or senator Rosenberg and 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 representative uh, Goldstein Rose were had been at three different events that day but had been to other events in between those three events so they couldn't have like carpooled um, but in this, it was a it was a great event, and and uh, it was interesting to sort of meet the kids and and have a chance to chat with them. Um, uh, second thing I want to bring up is that 
the PBTA hearing process for both the uh, changes in the uh, fares as well as changes to the routes uh, are happening as we speak. And, and uh, there was one last Thursday, the first, on campus at the university. Um, we had a person who'd gone to that uh, reach out to us, and, and uh, I will take their their uh, suggestions back to to the PBTA with me. Uh, but there's also a hearing tomorrow afternoon. We confirm the time. I believe it's 4:30 is the start time. It is in the Bangs Center. Um, yes, it starts at 4:30 until. No, I'm sorry. I know it's it says 4. It's 4 o'clock to 5.30. That's what it is. 4 o'clock to 5.30. It is a fairly formal process, so it, it is a bit kind of intimidating in some ways to go to one of those uh, because they come in and they do a presentation for a short period of time and then they take, you know, sort of formal uh, feedback from people. And so you have to step to the microphone and they have a transcriber there. It's kind of like being in court in some ways, so it's very disconcerting to people. But there are many ways in which you can reach out to the PVTA. They take emails. You can call them on the phone and leave a phone message. Um, uh, you can obviously come to the public hearing. Please, uh, I would like to encourage everyone to uh, you know, express their opinions and, and uh, suggestions. Uh, I do know that the, the staff of the PBTA do take them very, very seriously and try to incorporate those things that they hear about from, from the riders and from the public at large into, into the uh, next steps that they take. The PBTA Advisory Board will actually meet on the 28th of this month, uh, and we'll hear about what was gathered up in that hearing process um, and then we will schedule a special meeting in in, um, in April and I do not recall the date offhand um, where we will take action relative to that hearing process but we'll hear about the feedback and, and initial uh, uh, recommendations to us about uh, what changes uh, can and will occur uh, one other thing that's occurring I want to say the ninth but it may be I forget the date exactly. Um, I have an opportunity to go to Boston to a legislative meeting relative to the RTAs, uh, and I may take advantage of that. I think I have to let them know by this Friday. I believe it's next week, and if I can possibly go and attend that, I will. Um, and essentially, it's an opportunity for the RTAs, not just our own, but Franklin, uh, Worcester, everywhere else to uh, to kind of be in a room with legislators and, and impress upon them the need for a greater level of funding. Uh, the governor's budget currently is, is level funded from last year, which essentially turns into cuts uh, in a variety of ways. And so uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to, to uh, interact with the legislators and perhaps impress upon them the need to fund the RTAs a little bit better um, and support our, our communities uh, in a pretty profound way. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you actually was just um, the sister city, uh, the Kanakazaki reception for the youth mm -hmm. that are coming is this month and it's soon. Do you know the date? It is on the calendar somewhere. Report, I think. At one point it was on the agenda. Oh, yes, it's on the agenda. Oh, good. It is Wednesday, March, March 21st. Wednesday, March 21st, 4 30 to 5 30, right here in this room. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure to mention that because it's coming up soon. Um, it's a very brief and, and pleasant event for people to. Uh, to come and watch and see it's it's a pleasure to you know sort of meet the kids that are coming uh and do a bit of a whirlwind tour uh coming from from japan to here and so um they're a little uh overwhelmed in some respects but it's a nice opportunity to kind of meet everybody and and so i i would encourage people to if they have an opportunity to come and sort of see that it's nice it's a very very nice event um and i think for me that is um the last of the items, the PBTA being the primary one of, of note here in the next day or so. Okay. Um, a couple of things, I'll try to be brief. Uh, last week I attended the personnel committee meeting and they um, voted to um, adopt the new procedure manual they've been working on for quite a while and it'll be coming to the select board. Now we don't actually, it's, it's kind of funny, we don't have authority over the policies or the procedures. We have authority over the things in there that, has to, that cost money. So it's kind of a joint effort and Mr. Bogle might, might know or maybe at agenda setting it was talked about when they're planning to come to select board. It's in the offing, I just don't, re I don't remember that. It isn't like 
I'm think not sure the date. April yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's sort of a culmination of a lot of work, including the staff committee that has been working in concert with the personnel board. So um, just like that's a preview. Um, JCPC has been meeting every week except for the uh, public school vacation week. We had a week off and you know, that's it's kind of rigorous when it's happening and um, Mr. Slaughter, you recently had had that and we're meeting this Thursday and we're getting close to having heard all the um, proposals and then the harder part is then balancing out funds available with funds requested and um, that'll be coming up in the next you know couple of weeks so we're working hard and it's a good group and it's proceeding um, just parking downtown parking working group Matt I know you'd be disappointed if I didn't say something about it we had a very good meeting it was kind of an internal work session like okay get our act together and last time when that group came to the select board it collected a whole bunch of recommendations and it was sort of a package I think, um, and I'll know more after their next meeting, there are some recommendations we've already talked about that are not controversial within the committee we'd like to bring to the select board sooner. We might not have the whole package. There's other stuff we're working on that takes longer. And because other things are happening in the town relevant to some of the things we've already decided about, we thought we'd bring those sooner and it won't be the everything be all. Um, so. I uh, I don't have, I don't know when, but we're working towards coming forward with the things we feel pretty confident that committee wants to recommend to the select board. Um, the work uh, Mr. Steinberg and I have talked about before, um, working with the sponsors of the zero energy bylaw, um, working towards um, a revision that can come to annual town meeting. Um, I know Ms. Brewer has expressed concern, and, valid, and it's valid concern. It's a lot to do in a short amount of time, but I'm pretty confident now, especially after um, a, the last couple of meetings, that we will have um, a reasonable draft um, or you know, moving towards final language that can be brought to this board within the timeline we talked about earlier. And, um, I think we're close to something that could certainly go to council for feedback and start to shape up. And we're very aware that, you know, the sort of time is of the essence. Quality, the um, parties that have been meeting together have been meeting um, every week and with other meetings in between with their separate teams and work in between. So um, it's just to kind of keep you apprised that I think that could happen for spring, and that's what we're, for spring, annual town meeting we're shooting for. And then my last thing, it's not, I'm putting it under member reports, but when you're looking at the calendar, I wanted to mention one that um, April 18th, which is a select board meeting on a Wednesday, that I will be not available. I don't know exactly why, maybe that's Wednesday, because it's a town meeting. Monday's a holiday. Monday's a holiday. Okay, I won't be here that week. I'll be, I'll be out of the country. And we had talked a while ago, and I think October, our last select board retreat, was it October? Or was it November? A while ago. That we would have another retreat post the March 27th election because planning, we didn't know which direction. It was a big fork in the road, whichever way it goes, our planning. Um, we'll have to address that. So. I thought maybe soon, not tonight, but soon, if we picked a date for April, April's a busy month for people. I'm gonna be away a week. Mr. Steinberg has some stuff coming up that we might wanna hone in on a, on a date. Um, and I had some ideas of like maybe restructuring a little bit what, what time we did it and how we, how we managed that. But um, just planning ahead, it might be good to pick that because we can't do anything now, but I, we're gonna have lots to think about whatever the outcomes are. So that's my, that's my pitch. Sure. So associated with that, do you want to come up with some potential, so you're talking about in April, because April isn't busy enough. Um, uh, well, yeah. April how long do you want to wait? I know. Yeah. 
an April retreat date. And so we should bring that to the March 19th meeting then. And I'm saying we, cause I'm on agenda to setting for March. Or we could, we could ask but. Mr. Bachman to have staff poll us around some possible dates or you work know, three with his are here right now right i mean it's just those things just drag out forever is what i'm trying to get at so if we know for sure like this date and this date people are out well, of town then they I mean, can we've been doing two dates we've been doing saturdays i was gonna suggest we do afternoon instead of morning um there's some reasons i won't get into right now but um I think Mr. Steinbrick said he has some things, but they're not set yet. Okay, so for so sure you can't do it because you're going to be away. I'll be away from the 15th to the 20th. So not that weekend after. Right. Right. Actually, I can't do that set. Yeah. First. Not, so the, the, the Saturdays are No eight. 20. No, no 421. So the Saturdays are the, uh, the 7th, the 14th, the 21, and the 28th. Not the 21st. Thank you. I mean, we can try to pick it, pick something. April. All people. Okay. Please. Come up with a time too, because that'll make a difference in people's schedules if they think it's at nine in the morning versus if they think it's three in the afternoon. Yeah, or or one one o'clock or one o'clock. You know, something like one to four. Um. Thank you. Yes. I could follow up then um, with a couple of things. So looking at our agenda planning, so personnel policy revision was listed for March 19th, so I don't know if that's changed. But given what you just said, that they've already voted, maybe that is indeed. Maybe that is. The day. The day. I, I just don't know. I don't remember. I think that was going to gonna be forwarded to select board. I mean, to Mr. Bockelman for that's something that would come up at agenda setting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's Spotted currently it. scheduled for March 19th, but I mean, obviously things get moved. No, I think so, that's, that's probably, that sounds like the familiar date. I just don't remember. So along with what feels like 50,000 other things. So what I'm wondering, given the long list of things that are already theoretically happening on March 19th, including complete streets, crosswalks, seasonal license renewal, town manager performance goals, update review, sustainability committee structure in charge, personnel policy, revision we did move the municipal property up so we got that done um, first look at the town meeting warrant and setting our April retreat dates what my question was then going to be since we're not doing agenda setting this week and obviously other things will happen and other things will move etc but we're trying to get everything done before we start doing warrant articles right so I get mm. that the other piece I'm wondering about, though, is like associated with Complete Streets. I know they they were planning a meeting around this time before they get it to us. And with um, the Sustainability Committee, the next steps, and the personnel policy, if any of those things could be provided to us prior to the Friday before March 19th. Because even though I'm sure we've probably all already made plans for next week at this time, because we knew we didn't have a meeting, just that's a lot of stuff to absorb from Friday to Friday night to Monday night. And so I'm wondering if anybody is pretty close to ready, like say, I'm just giving the example of personnel, send it to us now and say, you're gonna talk about this on the 19th. That would be helpful to me in terms of stretching out my workload because Friday to Monday is always insane. And when it stays, when we get lots of stuff, it's hard. Just in terms of personnel, what I'm remembering, as my memories, is they, rather than reading, assuming we would read the whole document, we would get a link to it, but we would get a summary memo of a page. Summary which, memo. So that means okay. that the people who are working on that would need to have had the time to have done that ahead. So great idea. That's but my I, point. But I have no idea. You know, it, it's not just like sitting in, sitting in a box after that meeting and just zoom it away. It hasn't happened yet. Okay. And that's why I bring it up tonight oh, rather than bringing it up Thursday before. <laughs> I know, I'm just saying meeting. these all have a life of their own. Great right. idea. So I'm, I'm hoping that the town manager can discuss with staff what if any of these things might be available to us prior. Except this is going to happen, if this was this week, agenda setting's not until next week. Which is, yeah. So. But I, I, 
It's not going to happen. This is only Monday. You're saying we can't do anything until agenda setting next week? That's what I'm confused like about. What's going to be on the agenda? And How do you know what so then, happen? so then we'd have agenda setting Tuesday or Wednesday, and then we'd get the stuff on Wednesday, and we normally get it Friday. That's not really solving my problem. Well, you know, I really think it's unrealistic to think we're going to get all this stuff front loaded. Like, you know, if it could happen, great. But I think it's not necessarily a realistic expectation. It's also a completely unrealistic expectation that this board functions Friday night to Monday night. That's insane. And most boards don't have that short a period of time doing this kind of work. And so any time we can do it early, if somebody can't write the memo early, fine. If, but if they can, great. And you know, it's not always staff who has to write it. Sometimes it's a committee member. I appreciate the desire for it. Are there other things which go under member reports for topics not anticipated? If not, then I'd take a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. Sure, I'll second okay. it. All those in favor, please say aye. I don't yes. Know aye. aye. It's 9:53. Thank you, Amherst Media. <laughs>